Good morning to all of you, and uh, additionally to those who are watching on the stream. We have uh, Ustream live, and if you want to share it with your friends uh, electronically, uh, it's very easy. Just send them to ezor.org, ezor.org slash privacy stream. And uh, we will be, they will be able to watch at least what's on the screen. Um, and hear our discussion today. Uh, my commitment also to you, all of you who are here in the room, is that we will be finished on time and get everyone home uh, hopefully safely. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just mention at the outset, for those of you who may be uh, Twitter users like myself, uh, if you are interested in live tweeting, and if you're a Twitter user you probably know what that means, uh, commenting, hopefully positively, on the presentations as they happen so that people who aren't here can follow along. Uh, we ask that you use the hashtag TuroCLE, pound sign T-O-U-R-O-C-L-E. Uh, if you don't know what any of that means, don't worry about it. But it will be interesting to see how that channel occurs. For those of you who have not met me yet, uh, I'm Jonathan Ezor. I am an assistant professor of law here at Turo, and for the past, uh, well, it'll be 10 years next month, I have had the honor of being the director of our Institute for Business, Law, and Technology. Uh, the IBLT was started in March of 2003 with a mission not only of educating Turo Law Center's students in the cutting edge business critical issues, the intersection of law, technology, and business, but also educating practitioners and other professionals on these areas and sharing that information, spreading best practices, and ultimately encouraging and assisting in economic development here on Long Island and really beyond. We have done a number of programs over the years uh, we are moving into our second decade and have a lot of really exciting things going on. Uh, in that regard, I do want to mention, as I grab for my calendar, uh, we do have an upcoming event that I wish would encourage all of you to uh, at least make a note of, uh, and I want to get the date exactly right. Um, so it is April. Um, Sorry about this. April 19th, also a Friday morning, here at the Law Center, uh, we are pleased to be co-sponsoring an IP rights conference with the uh, commercial service of the U.S. Commerce Department and the law firm of Carter DeLuca. Details to follow, but it will be, uh, I think, a really very interesting and valuable business education event on IP rights. We have speakers coming, when I say from literally all over the world, one of our planned speakers will actually be addressing us live from South Africa. It's a little far for him to travel for the day. But I hope you will join us for that and for the other events that we have here, not only at the IBLT, but at Turo overall. We wanted to do this event today uh, on privacy. Because of all the areas of business law and technology, privacy is the one that I think is of most relevance, is changing the fastest, and really impacts on so many areas beyond the traditional, call it cyber law practice. Matrimonial attorneys now are both pleased with and concerned about the issues of what either their client or the other side has done online and how that works within the context of discovery, of negotiation, of scuttling negotiation when certain things are, are discovered and so on. Those in law enforcement, both defense and prosecution, are keenly aware of the kinds of wrongdoing that can occur uh, through identity theft, through appropriating someone's identity, credit card fraud, but also the investigative tools that are available 
to either tr track down a criminal or build a defense. It was noteworthy that within the last two or three weeks, both Google and Twitter uh, released their semi-annual transparency reports. If you haven't seen these, they are noteworthy. Uh, both companies announce how many requests for user data for taking down content have come from governments around the world. And in the last six months, both companies have literally received and, generally speaking, responded positively to thousands of requests for information just from the U.S. government, let alone all of the private litigants uh, whose records they did not disclose. Uh, anyone who is dealing now with any business with customers must be aware of the privacy issues, privacy about the identification of those customers, and balancing the value provided to them in exchange for sharing their personal information with the value desired by the company for its own use of that information and sharing it. Federal Trade Commission, the attorneys general, are very focused on those processes, uh, on not only the violations of law, but simply the miscommunication. The FTC has repeatedly sanctioned fine companies, not for breaking any particular laws, but simply because they said they would do X with the customer information they received, as described in a privacy policy, and instead they did Y. And even if X and Y are both legal, that disclosure failure was enough. FTC is even beginning to go more heavily against companies for failing to adequately secure customer records, even though there too, there is no specific federal law. It's about consumer protection. Anytime you're dealing in bankruptcy, uh, hopefully not your own, but if you're representing a client and there is a customer list involved in the bankruptcy as an asset, whether you're on the creditor side or representing the debtor, there are specific code provisions that have been added to the bankruptcy laws about what to do with customer lists, how to deal with what might have been promised in a privacy policy versus what the trustee in bankruptcy wants to do with that asset. And the requirement that you must actually name a, an ombudsman, an ombudsperson, who will balance the needs of the, of the estate and the needs of the creditors against this previous disclosure from a consumer protection sphere. And that's only here in the United States. Europe has an entirely different and often contradi uh, least dis different and different from uh, conflicting, excuse me, regime for data protection that is mandated for all of the European Union member states. There are safe harbors that American companies must follow in order to legally transfer personal data out of Europe. Canada has its own regime. Other countries. And the international issues are not just hypothetical. And it's not even the unsophisticated companies that necessarily get, uh, get attacked. This past week, a three-year-plus legal case finally came to a good end. Peter Fleischer, who is and was a senior privacy official at Google, was arrested three years ago in Milan, Italy, for violating Italy's privacy laws, along with three other colleagues. Now, Fleischer had done literally nothing other than showing up in Milan. But his employer had hosted a video posted by a couple of teenage thugs from Italy of a learning disabled classmate. And that posting of the video was illegal under Italy's privacy laws. And the prosecutor in Milan not only went after executives from the company that had hosted it who worked in another country, who had nothing to do with the posting, the removal, any of that. But they got convicted. Three of the four got convicted. And it was only this past month, 
I think three years after the original case, that the conviction was finally overturned. So your clients may find themselves literally under arrest and convicted of privacy violations because their company does something or is used for something that may be legal here and not legal there. Privacy is this very hot button issue and it is one of those areas of the law where consumers care. Even if they don't really know what they care about. About a month or two ago, there was this vast outpouring of posts and reposts on Facebook where people were saying that because of this particular quasi-legal-ish language that they were putting in their Facebook updates, Facebook would not be permitted to use their data in violation of their privacy. It had no legal impact, and it was based on an inaccurate understanding. But the force with which it spread showed the concern that consumers have about these things, and so on. Today's presentation is not theory. Our goal with the panel that we have is to provide you with real-world information, actionable information, best practices, and a solid understanding at the very least of the key questions when it comes to the collection, use, and sharing of personally identifiable information of personally identifiable health information, of information from children, and uh, of behavioral tracking information, what people are doing online. We also have a really, uh, I'm just very pleased with the speakers uh, at our panel about the role of the chief privacy officer. I'm sorry to say that Stephen Klein, who was set to be on the panel, was unable to attend at the last minute uh, but uh, our remaining panelists certainly can provide insights into why one has a chief privacy officer, uh, what, one, what a chief privacy officer does, how someone in that role deals with not only customer information, but employee information, and the interaction between a company and law enforcement governmental officials with regard to privacy issues. And, and I'm going to uh, end the day with the very appreciated, I know, ethics hour. Uh, always happy to give those. But focusing on something that we as attorneys sometimes take for granted, and for the non-lawyers, the lawyers next to you take for granted. Namely, what privacy laws apply to us? We're all very aware that we have an obligation of confidentiality with regard to client information. But we actually have more legal obligations than that and we have sometimes, because we're so used to keeping everything confidential, we sometimes forget and we don't take the precautions that a typical business person would. And I've, of course, got some bad examples to show on that. Uh, but let's get started. As I said, I want to get everybody out, here, uh, out of here on time. And uh, for our first panel, let me introduce uh, our first speaker, Paul Rebell, who has a very extensive bio that I'm happy to have you read in detail on page 144 of your materials. But I will at least summarize to say that Paul not only is a long-standing good friend of mine and of the Institute for Business Law and Technology, but an equity partner at Meltzer Lippi's corporate law, social media, and cloud computing groups. He is a trusted advisor to business owners. He helps entrepreneurs solve the legal business tax and cash flow issues that confront their companies each day. He counsels them about business matters, and at the same time advises them about legal affairs. Paul's had tremendous leadership roles in many of our regions, trade organizations, uh, foundations, bar associations. He, in fact, is himself a special professor of law at Hofstra University, where he teaches corporate law and contract writing, and I've please, been pleased to have him speak here on occasion to our students. Um, so, and so I turn the lectern over to Paul Rubel. Get you some. There, that's advanced. 
then this one if you want the lavender. So good morning. And Professor Rezor, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. I was um, very pleased, of course, to receive this invitation. At the time that I accepted the invitation a few months ago, I had no idea that only three weeks ago the United States government made this presentation a whole lot easier in passing a sweeping new change to the health care privacy laws, and we'll get to that in a minute. But you know, driving over here, I was thinking about the presentation, and it's National Privacy Day, so I decided that I wouldn't turn my car radio to XM radio and broadcast GPS signals to the world, and instead I turned on my phone, Bluetooth, transmitted some Bluetooth signals, and listened to Crosby Stills coming over here on my phone. Um, location data service is turned off, like I always do, except for find my phone, which comes in handy, and so I am broadcasting to the world. Anyway, um, I got a text message on the way over from somebody, so thank you for telling Verizon where I am, and of course all the media and tweets telling everyone where I am. So we have a lot of privacy today, uh, each of you. And I am trying to turn a slide. And so feel free, by the way, Professor Jonathan neglected to indicate the hashtag for today, which I think is Toro CLE. CLE. And to the extent you want this to be a tweet up, feel free to continue our, our privacy. So after I mentioned um, my phone and GPS and XM and all the challenges to privacy, Way back in probably the most fun year to practice law, 1999, the height of the boom, Scott McNeely, co-founder of Sun Microsystems, and some of you, that may not be a household name, they just invented small products like Java, OpenOffice, and Scott McNeely said, you have zero privacy anyway, so get over it. And one thing that we're going to talk about today is do you have privacy or not? So there are a number of topics that I'd like to speak about today in the context of healthcare and privacy. But you'll notice that we're going to talk about healthcare, privacy today, financial privacy, geolocation privacy, a bunch of adjectives. Of course, the noun is privacy, and the song remains the same through many of the different topics we're going to speak about. Uh, one of my favorite topics is the cloud, both um, as to storage and transmission of data, software development. We're going to speak a lot today about the cloud and the way it's affected privacy. We're going to talk about personal health information. This is a healthcare um, presentation, and in case you can't see it, I'll read this cartoon. How did the office find out about my operation? How did the office found out, find out? So keep personal health care information private to the extent you can. The government has helped us. We're going to speak about electronic medical records, EMR, the trend of the future, the government mandate, the threat to privacy, as well as the way of um, making healthcare more deliverable to patients. We're going to speak about social media and healthcare. We're going to talk about display privacy, information broadcast from monitors and displays and x-ray devices. We're going to talk about device security in the healthcare field and the way medical devices, wonderful as they are, also broadcast private information to the FBI and um, Iran and whoever else is looking for our information. So this being a CLE, we do have to talk some law as well as the fun stuff. So before January 13th of this year, when this really got interesting, um, there were some major laws, the HIPAA law and the high tech law. And we'll talk about the new regulations. So a moment, we'll talk about HIPAA. And HIPAA was passed during the Clinton administration, 1996. And although HIPAA has many, many facets, I want to speak today about the privacy rule and the security rule, two of the tenets about uh, which HIPAA is directed at, privacy and security. And first, I'll direct my comments to the privacy rule. So the privacy rule, of course, was an attempt by Congress and the government to help people keep their personal health information private and secure, yet at the same time allow doctors to treat, hospitals to provide health care, insurance companies to make it affordable, and there has to be some compromise between passing data. You know, how does a hospital provide services and send a bill without telling an insurance company what kind of services you had rendered? And 
where's the data flow going? So the privacy rule of HIPAA was an attempt by Congress to find a compromise. And so, as I said, healthcare does need personal health information in order to treat patients, in order to coordinate services so that you're a psychologist and primary care doctor and uh, related health professionals can all coordinate benefits and your local pharmacist at CVS can understand what's being prescribed. But we all need privacy. I mean, does everyone need to know about my or your specific medical conditions? It's certainly none of my business and it's none of your business. So how do we strike that compromise? And so two of the ways that um, Congress, in enacting the privacy aspect, the privacy rule at HIPAA, came up with two definitions, and these are definitions that are important to talk about today, the covered entity and the business associate. And a covered entity is a primary health care provider. Doctors, practices, hospitals, health plans, labs, clearing houses of information, and that's called, under HIPAA, a covered entity. And they are subject to direct government enforcement by Department of Health and Human Services. So if you're a covered entity, boy, it's a great thing. You provide direct health care to all of us, and the government is watching. And the other concept is the business associate. Business associates provide services to covered entities. They don't directly provide health care, but they do provide and furnish really important services so that when you go to the doctor, um, they can bill you, they can provide services, they can take tests, deliver results to labs, coordinate, transmit billing information, transmit your prescription to CVS. And so these services also use personal health information. And under HIPAA, business associates are not directly subject to government regulation. They're subject to contractual regulation. And this is a really important distinction that I'd like to, like to draw. And I write a lot of BAAs, business associate agreements, for clients, clients who are providers to the healthcare industry. Um, quick aside, everyone says, come on, Paul, it's just a, a form, use the form. And your business associate agreement needs, as all contracts need to be, drafted, customized, tailored to the particular client for whom you're working and providing services. And so to the extent this is a CLE, every contract that you write should not be a form. It needs to be custom tailored to your client. And a BAA is a way to, of, that the government ensures that the service provider, the software developer, the cloud data storage company who provides services to docs, to hospitals, to insurance companies, that they contractually agree to protect privacy. Contracts can be broken. The government has no jurisdiction under HIPAA to do anything about that breach other than um, to go to a, for the health care provider to go to court to uh, bring an action for a breach of contract. So that's the privacy rule. Under HIPAA, there's also a security rule. And a security rule really, really is a risk analysis. It requires health care providers, covered entities, to do a risk analysis, assess vulnerabilities in their own system, take steps to assess vulnerability, what its impact would be if there were a breach of um, personal health information, and to take steps to um, mitigate risk, improve operations. HIPAA also covers breach notification, which I'm not going to speak about too much, except there are requirements that to the extent that there is a breach of, of um, or a leak of your information, there are government regulations about how they need to be reported. And that's 1996. Then we come to President Obama in 2009, there's a theme, by the way, with Democratic presidents pr protecting privacy. And so Obama passed the High Tech Act of uh, 2009, and that was focused, among other things, about mandating electronic medical records, or EMR. And there is a government mandate for EMR to be adopted by 2015, 2016. There are fair phase in rules. And the goals of EMR are to help doctors with their beautiful handwriting to eliminate mistakes in treatment plans, eliminate mistakes in writing prescriptions so that um, CVS doesn't give you the wrong drug. You ever notice the way those drugs all have similar names anyway to us lay people? And if there's a handwriting error and a similar name, many people wind up getting uh, quite ill from wrong prescriptions. And uh, to make it um, 
possible for different drug stores to track different prescriptions so that it's harder for people to play the drug store game and go to Walgreens to get an interactive drug or an illegal drug or a controlled substance and CVS not to know about it. And, of course, to make sure that the delivery of health care is done effectively, efficiently, so that we're all healthy people. And the statutory phrase here is meaningful use. And the government encourages hospitals, health care providers to make meaningful use of EMR, electronic medical records. So it sounds cool, but what does meaningful use mean? Meaningful use means using certified EMR technology. And there's a certification rule. You can't just go to um, any electronic device distributor and, and use your EMR in order to come under the auspices of the High Tech Act. There's a, a certification process. And e-prescribing is one of the ways that meaningful use is used in terms of technology. Meaningful use also um, relates to the connection of technology from one device to another, one hospital to another, so that clinical personal health information can be coordinated. Meaningful use protects PHI because your electronic health records are created, stored, transmitted, and so the High Tech Act is focused on protecting that information. And the government decided to use financial incentives. Doctors get checks. All my software development clients can't wait to help. They, they said that um, there's a, a big push for software developers to get hired by doc practices because there are $44,000 checks waiting for every practice that adopts EHR. Also, there are financial disincentives on, to health care providers. Their Medicaid reimbursement is cut dramatically if they don't adopt and enable the use of EHR in the practices. And then January 13th of this year came, and Health and Human Services adopted sweeping new changes to the Privacy Rule, to the Security Rule, to HIPAA, to the High Tech Act, to everything that all of us learned in the last 10 years when we practiced health care law. And the reason for these new changes three weeks ago was to ensure that privacy and the privacy rules and the privacy mandates applied all the way down the chain, not just at the top level with doctors and hospitals, healthcare providers, insurance companies, but all the way down to data storage companies, software developers, billing companies. And one of the most dramatic changes is the change in the application of the privacy law to business associates. You'll remember that I said that HIPAA is focused on covered entities who already are subject to government regulation, so the new laws didn't really have to change those rules, but it dramatically changed the rules that apply to business associates. Business associates who formally needed to sign business associate contracts with covered entities, and I mentioned there's only a, the only remedy was a breach of contract claim. Well, business associates are treated under the statute. They're still called business associates, but they're treated for regulatory purposes exactly like covered entities. To the extent this sounds just definitional, I'll tell you this is way more than definitional. Software developers, cloud providers, billing companies now are subject to government regulation. You know, uh, government regulation, you can go to jail. You can be fined a million and a half dollars per violation. The government is not fooling around <clears throat> with these new regulations. They really want to mandate privacy. But the big change, left, the big change are subcontractors, and subcontractors are treated like business associates as well. Subcontractors create personal health information, they receive personal health information, they maintain it and transmit it. And in the world in which I practice, which is um, technology law, Cloud providers have become subject to HIPAA. And are they a subcontractor or are they, in fact, a, a business associate? So cloud providers transmit, store, and make available to healthcare providers and those in the chain of healthcare information the ability to transmit and use personal health information. Is a cloud provider subject under the new rules to the um, regulations um, that apply to covered entities, and the test is whether the subcontractor has access on a routine basis to personal health information. So there are some cloud providers 
under a limited exception, are not subject to enforcement. If they're merely a conduit, a telecom, Federal Express delivering prescriptions, not subject to HIPAA. But that's not really what cloud does. As you know, some data centers store personal health information. If you store, you're subject to HIPAA and covered entity regulation. If you help exchange personal health information, like e-prescribing, you're subject. If your cloud service is a, an application that processes number crunches, done some kind of algorithm with health information, you're now subject to direct government enforcement. If you help companies live up to the high-tech mandate and you provide meaningful use services, meaningful use technology, meaningful use devices, you're subject to HIPAA and to the new rules. Software developers also may become business associates and now under the new definition, business associates are treated the same way, subject to government enforcement as covered entities. Are software developers subject to HIPAA? No, if all you do is sell a product, but I'm not sure that software developers generally just sell. It's not like an office suite. Most software developers have access to the personal health of it, information. How would they have access? Well, if you host data, you're now a business associate. If you help troubleshoot your software, giving you access to data as you troubleshoot, you're subject to government regulation. If you maintain, that is, fix your software, which means going into a data center in which your app is stored and data is stored, you're subject to health care, to health regulation. I'm told I'm running low on time, so I'm going to slip some slides and talk about display privacy. This is a picture of... I guess some x-rays and different data. And so when you go to the hospital or the doctor, there are these valuable tools that help doctors treat, nurses to treat, and they shine. And anyone who walks by can see, look at that person's head, look at their brain, look at their meds, look at what kind of drugs they're on. And so the new regulations apply the privacy laws for the first time to displays, to monitors, to x-ray devices, to the output of information. And not just the big devices, but your phone, which can display information, your tablet, your eye device, photocopiers are now subject to government regulation. They are considered EMR devices. It's a wonderful thing, but a regulated device as well. Speaking of devices, the um, new regulations passed three, year, three weeks ago also apply not only the privacy law, but the security law of HIPAA um, to medical devices. Not just the display, the printout, the observation, but the devices themselves. And the FDA as well, the Food and Drug Administration, is also getting into the act of regulating the security of medical devices. And there are both high-tech devices that are impacted, implants, wonderful things, wireless devices that allow doctors to, to see your personal health information and, and, and treat you accordingly. Well, that's great, but the manufacturers of those devices are now subject to HHS, to government regulation. And not just high-tech devices, which is really cool stuff that I like, but even traditional low-tech devices, copy machines store information. It's amazing, but most copy machines today have hard drives, as you see on the screen. They really do. If a copier also scans, also faxes, it's got a hard drive. It saves personal health information. The government now regulates the manufacturers, the users of those devices. There can be security breaches when you use a hard drive. The device can fail and emit data. The battery can fail and emit data. Hackers, both kids having fun and governments, corporations can hack data, including healthcare data. And of course, mistakes happen too and that is disclosed. The new government regulations which enable the government to enforce the privacy law and the security law, formerly only to covered entities, now to business associates and subcontractors, software developers, including one sitting in the back who um, was really quite excited and troubled by the fact that, boy, we don't only have to worry about that contract, the BAA, you mean the government really is going to have jurisdiction over what we do, how we do it, how we store our data? Yes. Malwares, viruses can infect your device, your computer, your x-ray machine, your copier. And so to conclude, um, these new 2000 regulations really were a sea change in helping the government 
Help each of us in maintaining our health information to be personal and private. It, brought, it accomplished this in part by bringing in a much wider ambit of providers, people who normally would not have considered themselves to be in the, in the healthcare world, people that make tech devices, phone, ca Canon, makes photocopiers, they may be subject to HIPAA regulation. So a broad range of players are now involved in the healthcare scheme and so the onus, the defensive onus as we lawyers try to represent our clients is not only to ensure that our, our company's technology does help all of us in protecting privacy, but also to ensure there's compliance because if there's not compliance, there's going to be government regulation and the government can and will regulate. So be sure in advising your clients that you comply. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Before we get on to our next speaker, uh, I just want to let people know who might be listening in on the stream, and there are a number of them. Uh, I know that the way that the camera is pointed, you get to see us, but not necessarily the slides. So uh, if people are following along at home, or those of you who want to perhaps get digital versions, uh, they've been made available now uh, through Dropbox at ezor.org slash privacy CLE materials. So um, you can get all the presentations and the outline there. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Gina Bell, who is tweet, uh, live tweeting from somewhere in the back of the room. So thank you for keeping everyone else informed. Uh, our next speaker is William McDonald, who is a partner in the Advertising, Marketing, and Promotions, Intellectual Property, and Corporate Practice Groups at Olshen from Woloski in New York City. Bill has 15 years representing companies in a wide, ra wide range of industries in connection with information technology and intellectual property transactions, outsourcing transactions, privacy-related matters, mergers and acquisitions, and advertising and marketing law. Bill has been a certified information privacy professional since 2006. Prior to joining Olshan, Bill was with Dewey and LaBeouf's in New York City and is the former general counsel at one of the world's largest healthcare advertising agencies. Did you steal the cooker? Mouse or space bar. Click the mouse. Mouse or the space bar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see that there are as many people who are de as desperate for CLE credit as I am, given the weather. Um, so I've, I'm just going to jump right in. Jonathan's told you who I am. I only have 10 minutes. I suspect less at this point uh, to cover uh, data breach notification laws and children's online privacy. Um, so picking up from Paul's presentation at the end to talk about data breach notification laws, which are also known as security breach notification laws. Uh, so what is a data breach? A data breach occurs when there is a loss or theft or other unauthorized access to data containing the personally identifiable information, or PII, that results in a potential compromise of the confidentiality or integrity of that data. And these data breach notification laws basically require that covered entities give notice to individuals whose personally identifiable information uh, was or may have been uh, compromised. Um, California was the first state back in 2002 to enact such a law requiring a notification when unencrypted personal information wa was or reasonably believed to have been uh, acquired by an auth unauthorized person. Um, why did California enact this law? Uh, the primary reason was to mitigate uh, or to try to prevent fraud and identi identity theft, the theory being that if covered entities gave uh, an early notice to individuals, they would be able to take steps to mitigate uh, and protect themselves from identity theft. Um, a secondary 
uh, objective, obviously, is to incentivize businesses to invest in security measures by, one, imposing, you know, costly breach no- data breach notification costs on the businesses and also uh, forcing them to publicly disclose uh, data breach, which results in, uh, you know, obvious public embarrassment. Um, we're talking about real numbers here. You know, the average cost of a data breach is estimated to be between six and seven million dollars, uh, with larger breaches costing significantly more, multiples more. I've seen estimates of up to a hundred million dollars for some of the bigger uh, data breaches, in addition to sort of the public disrepute and the reputational harm that results to those businesses. Um, so, following, uh, ca- oops, sorry about that. So that's what I just said. Um, so, uh, after California enacted its statute in uh, 2002, uh, there were a slew of other bills introduced into Congress and the various state legislatures. And as a result, uh, today, in fact, the vast majority of states uh, and territories have data breach notification statutes. Um, shoot. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, uh, with 40, 46 states, since I flipped over that, 46 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands all have data breach notification statutes. Uh, on the one hand, you have uh, the Massachusetts uh, data security and breach notification regime, which is basically the na- nation's most rigorous. On the other hand, you have states like Alabama, Kentucky, New Mexico, and South Dakota, which do not have data breach notification statutes at all. Um, these, these statutes, which have now been enacted in, the, in 46 states and D.C., Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands, have had a true impact since 2002. There have been almost 2,700 data, breach, uh, data breaches reported. Wow. I don't know how I got that far ahead. I'm not even touching the computer. How do we go backwards? <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, great. So... Um, there are a few good resources out there for tracking these laws. Uh, I bet you it's my iPad doing that. Um, first, the National Conference of State Legislature. Uh, legislatures maintains an up-to-date listing of the various states and their statutes. Uh, also, specialty insurer Beasley uh, maintains a really interesting and good map of the various state data breach notification statutes, and you click on uh, there's the state, and it'll give you a synopsis. It'll give you a quick summary, and then below that, uh, sort of a summary of each state's laws. Um, and then Imation Court here, uh, Corporation, finally for, for this presentation, uh, which is a, st- a storage and data security company, created this compliance heat map uh, that's depicted on the screen behind me uh, to show you know which states had the the least strict and most strict laws. The white states, of course, don't have a law. Uh, the yellow states are. Um, the least rigorous, and the hot red states are the most rigorous. Um, So some of you might be asking why uh, you would need a resource like this, and uh, the answer is because the state's statutes are not uniform. The states are sort of acting in their role as laboratories, um, which uh, many people have viewed as a good thing. It's helped you know, people see what best practices are. It's helped, uh, you know, uh, states get out in front of these things. Um, <laughs> sorry, I decided to take my, my, leave my paper presentation at home and finally take the leap with an iPad, and it's, I'm sure it's causing all these issues in addition to the glare. Um, but at any rate, um, this lack of uniformity in the state data breach notification schemes uh, have uh, has resulted in uh, a, a bit of controversy and some uh, criticism for uh, creating an inconsistent and fragmented uh, notification scheme, um, which has resulted in uh, calls uh, from businesses, the White House, the Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Commerce, uh, for a national data breach uh, notification scheme. Um, and several bills have, in fact, been introduced in Congress uh, since uh, t- since 2002, uh, and none have uh, has yet to be enacted. Um, despite the lack of uniformity, uh, there the, all of the state statutes uh, have several elements in common. Um, first of all, they define who's going to be covered by the statute, whether it's private entities, 
not-for-profits, for-profits, government entities, um, and they generally they generally uh, apply to electronic compilations of data. Uh, they typically include a definition of personally identifiable information, and, uh, although there's no uniform definition, I think for today's purposes, uh, you can rely on the rule of thumb that it's a person's first name or initial, last name, and their social security number or other government issued identification number or credit card number. Um, and then there are various other elements that could be swept in as well. Um, uh, they also include a definition of a data breach, which we talked about earlier. It's an unauthorized acquisition of personally identifiable information that compromises the security uh, or integrity or confidentiality of that personal identifiable information. Um, then there is this, each of the statutes has a trigger for when notification is required. In some states, mere unauthorized access, I say mere uh, unauthorized access, is sufficient to trigger a notification requirement. In other states, there is a harm uh, assessment or a risk of harm assessment, the outcome of which will determine whether or not a notice is required. Um, the laws then go on to describe sort of the process for giving notice. Who has to give the notice? Uh, some states require third-party service providers to give the notice. Some require just the covered entity to do so. Uh, who the recipients of the notice will be, uh, whether it's pretty much always the individuals whose data has been compromised, uh, but there's a question of whether or not you have to notify state attorneys general. Uh, or your functional regulator. I would suggest if you're in the financial services industry or the insurance industry, you know, you should very strongly consider uh, informing your functional regulator of any data, data breach uh, in addition to any requirements you may have to notify affected individuals. Uh, the statutes will also dictate the timing of that notice. Some statutes simply say it has to be prompt uh, or without undue delay. Some statutes actually lay out a specific time period following a breach. Um, and the statutes indicate the methods for permissible notice, uh, whether it's you know a written notification or an email or whether substitute or mass media no notice is permissible. Uh, and then finally, some states include a provision for delayed notification for law enforcement and national security reasons in order to give people an opportunity to investigate the, the reason for the data breach. Uh, many states include a safe harbor for entities that are covered by Gramm-Leach-Bliley or HIPAA, uh, as long as those covered entities are actually in compliance with those statutes. Um, and then finally and importantly, uh, every one of the data breach notification statutes of which I am aware uh, provides a safe harbor for encrypted data. In other words, if encrypted data is accessed and acquired, then as long as the data is encrypted again, there's no notification required. Uh, some states include a private right of action for affected individuals, either to obtain uh, civil damages or injunctive relief. Uh, some states also uh, empower the attorney general to enforce the data breach notification statute. And some states say only the attorney general <clears throat> can bring enforcement actions under the, the laws. And I will say with respect to private rights uh, causes of action, there have been many of them. Most of them have foundered uh, because the individuals can't prove damages. Um, and then finally, the laws, of course, provide for various penalties, uh, including civil penalties and uh, penal injunctive relief. Um, so that wraps up uh, data breach notification laws. Uh, I think the, the important takeaway here is that encrypted data is a safe harbor. Uh, and while that may be more expensive, it may, in the long run, end up saving you money. Um, next, we turn to children's privacy. Sort of apropos of nothing there, but um, the principal U.S. law governing children's pri privacy in the United States is the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. Uh, which is implemented through the Federal Trade Commission's uh, COPPA rule, which was promulgated initially in 2000. Uh, now, the primary goal of COPPA is to empower parents with the ability to control what information uh, 
what information uh, is collected by online service providers, website op operators, from their children. The rule applies, the COPPA rule applies to operators of commercial websites and online services directed to children under 13 uh, that collect, use, or disclose personal information from children and operators of general audience websites or online services with actual knowledge that they're collecting, using, or disclosing personal information from children under the age of 13. Operators covered by the rule have to do several things. First, they have to post a clear and comprehensive privacy policy on their website. Uh, they have to provide direct notice to parents and obtain verifiable parental consent before gathering any information from children. They have to give parents the choice of consenting to the operator's collection of information from children for internal use by the website, uh, but prohibiting the operator from uh, disclosing that information to third parties. These operators have to provide parents access to their children's personally identifiable information uh, and the right to delete that information. Or uh, they have to give parents the opportunity to prevent further collection of that information, and they have to maintain the confidentiality, security, and integrity of that information. In addition, the COPPA rule requires, uh, prohibits operators, excuse me, um, from conditioning a child's participation in any online activity, uh, online activity um, by, to providing more information than is reasonably necessary to participate in that activity. I had some good luck as well, uh, the same sort of luck that Paul had. Um, the real news here is that um, after uh, some 13 years, uh, the FTC conducted a fairly extensive review of the COPPA rule and uh, issued a final revised rule in December of last year. Uh, that rule becomes effective July of this year. Uh, according to the FTC, According to the FTC, uh, the final amendments uh, accomplish a number of things. First of all, they modify the list of personal information that can't be collected without parental notice and consent, uh, clarifying that this category includes geolocation information, uh, photographs, videos, sound recordings, anything that might include the child's image or voice. Um, it provides companies a streamlined way of obtaining or of developing new approval processes for verifiable parental consent. It closed a quote-unquote loophole that allowed uh, child-directed direct, applications and websites to permit third parties to collect personally identifiable information from children without uh, parental notice and consent. Uh, extended the COPPA rule to cover persistent identifiers. I'm skipping a couple of things just because of time. Um, strengthened data security protections uh, by requiring uh, website operators and other online service providers to make sure that their third-party service providers could maintain uh, the confidentiality and security of children's data and requiring, requiring uh, those operators to, undertake, to get assurances from those third-party service providers to that end. Um, and then it strengthened the Federal Trade Commission's oversight of the self-regulatory safe harbor programs. Uh, and those safe harbor programs are essentially programs set up to come up with mechanisms for obtaining verifiable parental consent, which uh, programs are then uh, signed off on by the Federal Trade Commission. So how did the FTC accomplish this? Uh, first of all, they modified several important critical definitions. Um, First of all, the definition of operator uh, was updated so that the rule covers child-directed sites um, and services that integrate outside services, uh, such as plugins or advertising networks that collect personally identifiable information from children. Um, the definition of website or online service directed to children was expanded to, to include those plugins or ad networks that they have actual knowledge that they are collecting uh, personally identifiable information through a child-directed website or service. The effect of that would be that COPPA would apply directly to those uh, third parties. Um, the definition of personal information was also expanded, as I noted before, to include 
uh, geolocation <coughs> information, as well as photos, videos, and audio files that contain a child's image or voice, and persistent identifiers that can be used to recognize a child uh, over time or across different websites or online services. Um, with respect to parental notice, the amended final rule uh, adopts a just-in-time notice scheme um, that is designed to give uh, parents, one, designed to clarify privacy policies and also to, dis to clarify and uh, make more concise and clear uh, the notices that parents receive uh, in order to give their parental consent to their children's uh, disclosing of information to different serv services. Um, with respect to parental consent mechanisms, verifiable parental consent mechanisms, the FTC added several new options, including electronic scans of signed parental consent forms, video conferencing, the use of government-issued identification cards, uh, identification numbers, excuse me, or cards, um, and alternative payment systems under certain circumstances. Um, importantly, uh, 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 drafts of the final rule eliminated the so-called email plus option for obtaining verifiable parental consent when website operators wanted to collect children's personally identifiable information for their internal use. Um, that was met with a great deal of resistance and I think <coughs> fortunately for website operators and online service providers, uh, they, the FTC in the end elected to keep uh, email plus as a Verify as, as a means of, as an accepted means of obtaining verifiable parental consent. Uh, although FTC did go out of its way to ask industry to start to develop new ways of obtaining verifiable parental consent because it views Email Plus as a less reliable form uh, of obtaining that consent. Um, in terms of confidentiality and security requirements, we are, the amended final rule requires operators to take reasonable steps to make sure that uh, children's PII is released only to service providers and third parties that are capable of maintaining the confidentiality, security, and integrity of that information and who uh, are willing and do give assurances to the website, oper website operator, online service provider operator, that they will do so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Federal Trade Commission is taking steps to increase its oversight of the safe harbor programs by, uh, by requiring the safe harbor programs to audit their members and then to report back annually uh, the aggregate results of those audits. And that's it. Great. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. <clears throat> we actually uh, have a couple of minutes. Uh, for questions, if you're willing to just sort of stand here, Paul, because I want to get you both on camera rather than having disembodied voices. Uh, and uh, I hope, for the benefit of the stream, I will repeat the questions uh, also for the recording. Yes? So uh, the question was why COPPA only applies to children under the age of 13 rather than helping to protect children who may be young teenagers 13 and 14 years old. This is going to be something of an unsatisfying answer. Uh, sorry, this will be sort of an unsatisfying answer, but it's, it's basically an arbitrary cutoff. The decision was basically made to protect the most vulnerable community among children and, you know, 13 whether it's 12, 13, 14, that's where the cutoff was made. But you're right, obviously. Yes?
So uh, briefly, briefly, the question uh, comes from one of our audience members' experience at an optometrist, you said, uh, where apparently the optometrist uh, had access to her overall electronic health records from her other doctor, uh, and the, the, what she received as information from the optometrist was that it was mandated that whether or not the patients were going through particular insurance, that everyone had to be entered into the system and uh, whether that was, in fact, part of uh, the legal requirements under HIPAA? It may be part of the legal requirements. Um, it may be a breach of the legal requirements. Um, you talk about insurance and finance and big business. In fact, one of the reasons why we have a, a new um, health care law, um, and, and I'm referring to you know, what's called Obamacare, is because of the difficulty um, in financing health care. So insurance companies may do as they want, Consent notwithstanding, I went to a lab the other day to have some blood drawn. Um, I don't have a copay. I have great health insurance, fortunately, through my job, and they wanted a swipe of my credit card anyway. They said, I, I'm not swiping. I'm covered. You can go on the computer and see that I'm covered. I know, but we want to swipe anyway. I said, well, I'll pay cash. I don't have to pay anything, but if I pay cash, do I have to give you a swipe of my credit card? They said, yes. So the fact that the regulations... Um, require your consent to be given and that they ha the doctor had access. I'm not surprised. I'm not shocked. I'm disappointed to hear that. There are also um, incentives within particularly the more recent High Tech Act updates to encourage faster adoption uh, of these technologies that there are some financial incentives that are offered to providers who uh, enable so-called meaningful use of the data it's, it's very much a carrot and a stick approach. So, and the final thing I just want to add to Paul's answer is a lot of doctors and healthcare providers, out of the best of intentions, do more than they need to, less than they need to. One of the real challenges of, of HIPAA compliance is it's just so complicated. Uh, so you can ask two similarly situated providers, they're going to be doing things totally differently just because that's what they understood they have to do. And doctors aren't supposed to have, you know, in the waiting room, sign-in sheets anymore so that you can't see the name of the other patients in the room. Some do, some don't. I went to a doctor recently, and they used black magic marker to white out, to black out everyone's name. You could see through it. Um, and you can hear the doctor or the nurse talking in the back and hearing. I mean, people come out, and I, I know all about their health care conditions. So the best of intentions, the best of statutes, the best of industry regulations, maybe it's better than it would have been otherwise, but it sure isn't perfect. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, moving on. It was um, interesting to me. I wanted to see sort of where we are. Uh, and there was a piece today in The Guardian UK entitled or, um, Extending the Edge, Data Security and Privacy in Bit is Business. With technology changing rapidly, enterprises need to update their approach to enable greater control and reduce risk. And those are two themes that you're hearing throughout this morning. One of the ways that enterprises, and take that phrase, enterprises, um, as a much broader than you would think, they can be very small companies as well, but one of the ways that they are getting a better handle on this is by creating and staffing the role of a chief privacy officer. Someone whose responsibilities include both helping to understand and manage the flow of consumer and customer information, but also internally dealing with employee and other data. Someone, uh, this person has to interface across disciplines in a way that's really unique, I think, uh, across information technology and sales and marketing and finance and risk management and insurance and legal. And in fact, uh, while our panelists are in all attorneys, chief privacy officers can be non-lawyers coming out of either a compliance or IT. And you see that all across. Um, so what we wanted to do this morning for the next hour and a quarter is hear from people who have been in and around these roles as chief privacy officers or dealing with companies 
on privacy issues, uh, either formally titled as chief privacy officers or simply playing that role. Uh, and we have three really, really top-notch uh, presenters. Uh, the first being Ken Dreifach, whose bio is somewhere in the back. Uh, thank you, Ken. There we go. Uh, you can see it on page 130 of the materials. Um, Ken Dreifach represents and counsels clients on complex issues involving information privacy and data law, online liability, and consumer regulatory law. He focuses on issues particular to the data, games, and gaming, online advertising, and online media industries. He has more than 20 years of experience in high-profile regulatory in-house and private practice roles, addressing cutting-edge internet law and privacy issues. From 2000 to 2006, Ken was chief of the Internet Bureau of the New York Attorney General's Office. Uh, under that leadership, the Bureau brought groundbreaking enforcement actions protecting Internet users from fraudulent and illegal practices. Uh, he has significant in-house experience working with emerging technology companies. Currently, uh, most recently, he has served as the General Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer of Rapleaf, a leading consumer data company in the Bay Area that is a hub for online and offline data storage. From 2007 to 2010, he was Deputy General Counsel of Linden Lab, operators of the Second Life Virtual World and Virtual Currency Platforms, although Ken assures me it was a real job. Uh, he, is, he has served on a number of boards, and he is currently um, counsel to Zwilton. Uh, anyway, Ken uh, has brought presentation, which I'm about to load in, and uh, we welcome him. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. So when Jonathan asked me to speak about what a chief privacy officer does, it occurred to me that chief privacy officers at different companies do very different things. There are very large companies. There are small companies. There are companies in the tech space, companies that deal with data. So really, there are many different hats that chief privacy officers um, wear. H how many of you in the audience if I could see a show of hands, have, have worked at a company or at any point dealt with a chief privacy officer. Okay, so really only a, only a smattering. If I come back here in, in three years, hopefully not in February in a snowstorm, but if I come back here in three years, there are going to be three or four or five times as many, as many hands up. Um, in, in my case, I had uh, experience, I've had experience um, working with companies as outside counsel, but also uh, in-house as, as a chief privacy officer. And just, just by my background, um, those, the two positions that I've had, have, or the last two positions I've had, have had very different objectives. So um, I moved out to California about five, six years ago. Don't ask me why I came back on a day like this. Um, but, but I moved out there to, uh, to be deputy general counsel at a company called Linden Lab, as, as John mentioned. It's basically the operators of a virtual kind of 3D experience gaming platform called Second Life. Anybody hear of Second Life? It was, very, it was very big all the rage a few years ago. It's still around. But privacy played a very important role in the product design at that company because hundreds of thousands of people were, were going uh, into this world in this anonymized form, and it was very important to them that their experiences, audio, visual, uh, chat, creation, and, and all the kind of, some of the kind of weird fantasy stuff that they were doing was, was kept private. So we really had to, had to think about privacy from, th from the beginning of every product experience. Um, my, my, after that, I went to a company called Rapleaf, also uh, now it's called LiveRamp, which was fundamentally a data company. It was a company that, that dealt with uh, data, selling consumer data, working with companies who wanted to learn more about their, their consumers, and also taking data and working with this whole vast online ecosystem to help companies send ads online. 
So there, working as chief privacy officer, I was also general counsel, involved a, a great deal of, um, of data work, figuring out what data you were allowed to use, what the privacy laws were, uh, according to uh, under that govern that data, what the contract laws were. So really very different objectives. So every every company that has a chief privacy officer is going to have a slightly different um, uh, objective uh, in terms of the duties that that person does. Many more companies, as Jonathan mentioned, are hiring chief privacy officers. Now about a dozen years ago, the position really just kind of came into its own, but the companies that had chief privacy officers were, were usually companies that were very deep in the, the data and the privacy uh, ecosystem. There were companies like, back then, DoubleClick, which is now part of Google, uh, AOL, um, Hewlett Packard, uh, IBM, companies that were dealing with just huge amounts of data. Today, uh, close to 30% of Fortune 500 companies, and we're talking about, about you know, retailers and so on, have chief privacy officers. These are not companies that would consider themselves even in the information technology industry. And the reason that that's happening is something that's, that's called big data. How, how many of you have heard the term big data? It's almost become, okay, so, so a lot of you, it's almost become a, a catchphrase. And any, anybody in the audience have a definition of big data? Because uh, having been working with data for years, we never thought of data as little data <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, so, so here's the definition that I like about big data. Um, there's, there's more volume of data. It's called the three Vs. There's more volume of data today than ever before. Just more stuff out there. There's uh, more variety of data than ever before. We've got mobile data uh, in forms that we certainly didn't have even five years ago. Social data from platforms that certainly did not have the type of data even five years ago that they have today. Uh, online data offline data, and all of it is merging and getting mushed together across channels. And every retailer out there, every B2C uh, company that has, that has really a significant number of consumers is capturing data from all these different channels. And somebody has to steward the data. And the next thing that has really led to companies hiring more chief privacy officers and staffing the position is the media scrutiny that's been given to privacy and data issues, starting maybe with, with the Wall Street Journal's uh, What They Know series. Anybody read the Wall Street Journal What They Know series? It started two and a half years ago. It got an honorable mention for Pulitzer, and essentially it's been this, some would say, muckraking uh, expose on how data is used by, by companies in America. And that has led to government scrutiny. So Congress, the Senate, FTC has opened up uh, investigation after investigation, hearing after hearing on mobile platforms, uh, consumer privacy, Facebook, and, and so on. So in the face of all of that, lots of companies are realizing that privacy is really a brand value. If they want to compete in this ecosystem, compete for, for customers, and really put themselves out there as a high-trust platform, a partner that you can you can work with and not be worried that you're going to be profiled in the Wall Street Journal, you have to have a chief privacy officer. And I'm going to talk about the different roles that chief privacy officers tend to play, the different hats that they wear. So that's sort of my gimmick here. I think this is the Willy Wonka hat. Um, so chief privacy officers at a number of companies play a role in the product and design, uh, the, uh, on the product and design teams. The FTC has had a credo for a number of years now um, along the lines of privacy by design. They want companies that are using data to design, to design products with privacy in mind, to basically bake in privacy. So when you're, when you're at a company, particularly a company that's building products, um, you need to have a, a chief privacy officer to, uh, from the beginning of, of the product um, timeline, help the product people understand what kind of data can be used and how it can be used. So, you know, I've worked with companies, I've been at companies where product people who are, who are you know, tend to be very creative and tend to see things the way that, that maybe they should be, obviously don't, don't intuitively get what the laws are. They're not legal people. Um, so you get ideas like, gee, you know, shouldn't, wouldn't it be great if kids could just interact with each other, interact with adults. 
really just kind of sidestepping all the all the copper protections that we just talked about wouldn't it be great of banks could make decisions about who to give credit to based on social media information i would be great if we could d anonymize all these anonymous postings and learn more about people these are all the sorts of ideas that that clients you know come to us with that you you know you get hit with as a chief privacy officer and and you have to be there at the beginning uh... part of your role is to explain not only the laws around this because you know in these cases you've got thick and and um, kappa that apply to to these examples but you know what the ecosystem will say what the media will say where as eric schmidt famously said uh... he said a couple of years ago that google's um, google's policy is when it comes to privacy is to understand where the creepy line is and to get as close to it as they can but not step over it so that's part of what you're doing in, in product design as, as chief privacy officer figuring out where you know the world where the media where regulators think the creepy line is and not i mean preferably not even getting <laughs> within an inch uh, uh, of it then there's the enterprise uh, chief privacy officer Many companies, so I've worked at, I've worked with companies that are very large, but I've worked at companies that, that are small to medium size. But companies like, like, you know, like, like Computer Associates or IBM, et cetera, that have thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of employees in many different countries, vendor relationships across the world, have a very inward looking, I mean, among other focuses, have a very inward looking focus because you have to be the steward of all of this proprietary data. You have to manage healthcare data, uh, in, insurance data, vendor data. Much of it is sensitive, much of it is confidential. And your role, at least wearing this hat, is to understand what data needs to be protected and how it needs to be protected. Reconciling uh, global laws and creating internal policies that work uh, in each in each uh, jurisdiction, and then of course being there to build trust internally because employees don't want to work at a place where their information is going to be spilled. Certainly, vendors don't want to partner with companies that don't have someone that can step forward and say, you know, we've got this covered. Your data is protected. We can put you in touch with the security uh, team as well if if you need to. So then, so I just talked about the kind of inward-focused chief privacy officer. There's then another hat, which is the external chief privacy officer. Certain companies, because of what they do, because of their focus or because of the focus that's been put on them, really have to maintain a very strong external presence to maintain trust externally that, that they're protecting data, whether it's vendor data or consumer data. So... For instance, you know, Facebook, Facebook hired a, uh, someone named Aaron Egan to be the face of privacy uh, at, at, at Facebook, no, no pun intended. And if you're chief privacy officer at a company like that, you're going to be, um, be meeting with regulators, be meeting with self-regulatory groups, be meeting with, uh, chief, chief, uh, with, with uh, privacy advocates, and cultivating this sense of trust externally at conferences like this and, and, and so on. This is not a hat. Well, it is a hat. This is a, this is a, uh, 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 Justice Scalia wearing a silly hat. I don't know what kind of hat that is, by the way. It, it may be a beret. I don't know. Um, then there's the lawyer as, as chief privacy officer. Yes, please. St. Thomas More Academy. It's, what is it? St. Thomas More. Oh, of course. It's St. Thomas More. That makes sense. Thank you. Got it. Got it. Okay, well, then, then that's particularly appropriate because the lawyer, as chief privacy officer, is essentially trying to keep uh, the company honest and trying to make sure that the company behaves and trying to make sure that the company adheres to all of the codes and laws that the data is going to be uh, covered by. So this sometimes it, it, it's going to involve actual written laws and statutes, like COPPA, like the Fair Credit Reporting Act, or deceptive practices laws, making sure that what you're saying externally is what you're adhering to. But there are many, many other codes, industry codes, self-regulatory codes, that companies have to adhere to because they apply to data that are not necessarily 
that don't have the force of law. Uh, there are ethical marketing practices under the Direct Marketing Association. There are online advertising uh, codes under the DAA. There are codes specifically applying to behavioral advertising. So lots of companies in that industry have to abide by the NAI's code. And increasingly, there are these emerging codes for how we deal with mobile marketing and mobile data. And if you're a chief privacy officer, you're going to have to know these codes and understand how they, uh, how they apply to the data that, that you're attaining. And then finally, there's this, there's this whole, I alluded to this before, but there's this whole industry that's being driven by data. Now, about five, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you had data companies, you still do, like Axiom, Epsilon, Experian, that, that were basically the go-to people if you wanted to buy files of data on millions of people and your customers, essentially. There are now hundreds, maybe thousands of companies that are taking lots of data, selling it, uh, analyzing it, modeling it, using it for marketing, using it for research. And these companies themselves have to hire really significant privacy and data teams. So it's kind of the chief privacy officer giving way to what's now being called the chief data officer. And um, that's some of what I did when I was at, at, at Rapleaf. Essentially, you're figuring out with respect to data, usually other companies' data, but it's other companies' data that's about all of us, what the rules are. And those rules are built into uh, contracts. They're built into licenses. They're built into some of those industry codes I just talked about. And they're, to some extent, built into laws. So the chief privacy officer in that role is also a data strategist, figuring out how data can be used, how data can be combined, and again, whether it you know, violates privacy expectations. So I think I'm, I think I'm probably just about, just about done. So that was well-timed. And um, the privacy role of chief, of ch the, the role of chief privacy officers is going to keep evolving. We're, we're kind of at the beginning of this cycle as we're figuring out, you know, as the industry is figuring out what to make of all this data, social, mobile, and so on, the chief privacy officer is going to be central to that. And as retailers and other companies are taking in and figuring out what they can do and what they need to do with all of this data, they're going to be hiring more chief privacy officers and chief data officers and increasingly equating that position with, with brand value. So it's a... Um, it's, it's, it's a field that I'm happy to be in, and hopefully some of you, of your students, will, will go into it uh, as well. Thank you. Our next speaker this morning is Bonnie Yeomans. Bonnie is, an assistant, is the Assistant General Counsel and Privacy Officer of CA Technologies, a large Long Island-based software company. And in fact, if you were up on our fourth floor looking north, uh, you can see CA from here. Uh, kind of like Russia, but different. Uh, she has been, she's been a member of the Worldwide Law Department within CA Technologies since 1990 serving in various capacities, including software licensing, advertising, real estate, ethics, and regulatory compliance. Since 2004, Bonnie's role as CA's privacy officer has included managing all matters relating to compliance with worldwide data protection laws, helping to ensure that the company and its employees understand and implement appropriate procedures and security for the protection of personal information. Um, and uh, she has recently joined the advisory board of Glamour Gals, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to inspire and organize teens to provide ongoing complimentary beauty makeovers and companionship to elderly women living in senior homes. So uh, someone who's very into both professional and public service. And with that, Molly, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everybody, for braving it and coming out here today. 
Um, I, I can't say that CA is quite as exciting as the companies that Ken uh, works for. But we don't do a lot of consumer fund game stuff, but we are pretty important to Fortune 500 and uh, most large enterprises out there. Um, I've been with CA as, if you did the math, um, 23 years, and uh, if you're trying to figure out my age, I started when I was 10. So, <laughs> uh, but no, I, I like it there, as you can tell. Um, it's, it's a great company to work for. We have uh, 14,000 employees or so uh, worldwide in about 100 different countries. Uh, so when I started doing um, privacy work, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, I, before that, for the first 13 years there, I did software licensing, um, negotiating contracts with our customers. Um, and after about 13 years of negotiating the same uh, warranty and liability clauses, I, I figured I, it's time to move on to something else. Uh, and I started doing more regulatory work, um, export compliance and FCPA and those kinds of things. And privacy was just one little piece of what I did because back then, privacy really wasn't what it is today. It was just something you did on the side. Um, it was really, Europe was the only place that really had anything going on, um, Canada and Europe um, were the only places where really people cared about privacy uh, back then. And so I, you know, since we did operate in Europe and Canada, that was really where I focused. And um, as, you, as you may know, and Jonathan mentioned it at the beginning, Europe's privacy regime is very different than the U.S. Um, there's a basic concept of, um, you know, that my personal information is personal. Anything about me, anything that identifies me. So my email address is personal. Um, we don't really have that concept in the U.S. In the U.S., it's basically, as long as you can't steal anything from me, I don't really care what you use. You, you know, as long as you're not taking my social security number, my credit card, my bank account, um, and you can't use it to do identity theft or get into my, you know, into my bank, um, yeah, fine, here's my information. Uh, you know, everything's up on Facebook, nobody really cares. I have a teenage daughter on Facebook, I'm constantly telling her, do not put that up there, do not put that up there. But nobody really cares about it <laughs> until, until it actually affects them. So uh, Europe is a whole different story. Um, they really do care there, I feel, more than we do here about the fact that this is me. I, I did not tell you that you can email me. I did not tell you that you can provide my name to somebody else. Um, so that was a big, it's, it's difficult to kind of comply with that in a, in a company that is trying to sell things to people. So one of the issues you grapple is, with is, is the email. Um, you know, every company uses email as a cheap and efficient, effective way to communicate and try to sell things. Um, in Europe, they actually have an opt-in requirement as opposed to opt-out. Um, in the U.S., you're allowed to email anybody you want. As long as you put an opt-out footer and, and comply with an opt-out request, you could pretty much email anybody. In Europe, you're really not supposed to email people that you don't have a relationship with or who have not actually said, I want to receive email. So that's, that's really difficult. It's just one area that I was dealing with back then, and those are the kinds of things I dealt with. And then over the years, the past 10 years, um, you know, California came out with its Privacy Act, its, its breach notification law, and then, uh, you know, as Bill mentioned, there are 46 states plus territories that now have data breach notification laws that all say all different things, and it's a complete nightmare if you have to actually comply with these breach notification uh, statutes. So my job is to make sure that I don't have to <coughs> actually comply with those breach notification statutes and try to prevent the breach up front. Um, and that's really also the mass regs. I know uh, he touched on it a little bit, but Massachusetts, if you're really interested in learning a little bit about how this country is going um, in terms of protecting sensitive information, uh, I think it's a good idea to, to read the Massachusetts Information Security Regulation that came out in 2010. Um, it's really easy to read. It's like written in English, and um, it's, uh, it's, an actual, it's a really good roadmap for companies to follow um, to, to ensure that they're protecting sensitive data. And what we've done at CA is apply the mass regs um, across the board for all data. It really only applies to information of a Massachusetts resident. Uh, but it's really difficult for companies to segregate data that way, so we just apply it across the board. And it, it provides different requirements, um, like process requirements, like you're not allowed to give information to someone who doesn't need it, or um, 
leave it on your desk without it being secured, things like that, as well as IT requirements like encryption. It actually is the first law that really required companies to put in place specific um, information technology security around data. Before that, it was like, you know, you have to ensure technological and physical security to protect the data. It was all mushy legal language. Now, like the mass regs actually says, if you're providing this kind of information electronically or wirelessly um, or by email or any way, it has to be encrypted. So it's a really, I loved when the mass regs came out because I could finally point to something and say, look, we have to do this. This is now a law. You can't tell me we can't do this. So um, it became, privacy over the last 10 years became a lot more invasive and, and you know, it's, it's now in everything like the, the previous speakers were mentioning, um, the new high tech uh, um, omnibus rule that just came out from the Department of Health and Human Services is is huge. I mean, for example, for a company like CA, um, as Paul was mentioning, you know, we never really had to comply with HIPAA before. We're not in the healthcare field. We have nothing to do with healthcare. We don't provide healthcare services um, at all. But because our customers are covered entities, our customers are hospitals and healthcare providers, now they're requiring us to, uh, now under HIPAA, we're directly responsible for complying with certain of the HIPAA regulations. Before that, it was a contract. Our hospitals would, you know, before they sign a software license agreement, they'd send us a three-page, five-page business associate agreement, and we would sometimes say, no, we don't want to sign that. We're not a business associate. We're not in the business of processing healthcare mm -hmm. data. Don't give us your healthcare information. All we're doing is selling you software. We do provide support. If you have the support issue, send us the data, but take out the PHI. We don't need it. And we didn't want to be bound by those contracts. Now, whether you have a contract or not, you're responsible, directly liable under HIPAA. The Health and Human Services can, can come after you. They can audit. They can come after you. So now we want to have a business associate agreement in place so that it's very clear with our customers what our responsibilities are with respect to the information we receive from them. So that's a huge thing that, that's come about. The cookie legislation um, in Europe and now in different countries, they're requiring that before you drop cookies on somebody's computer, that you have a clear and conspicuous notice on the website where the cookies are, are being dropped from and that you tell people about it. And what does that mean? You know, some companies are having, I don't know if anybody's noticed, if you go to some European company sites, you know, you'll get a big pop-up now that says, uh, we, are, we are dropping cookies on, you know, do you accept it or not? And, uh, you know, our marketing people don't really want to do that because it kind of looks ugly when someone comes to the site and it looks like we're you know, being a big brother and dropping things on people's computers, but, you know, you may have to do that. That's still a little bit out there and not a lot of companies are complying yet. Um, but I will say one of the most important things I've learned over the 10 years is that you have to make friends with certain people in the company. As uh, If you're responsible for privacy, it's really important to make friends in certain areas. One is security. Got to get to know the security people, the IT people, because they will be your buddies. And a lot of privacy is security, and security is privacy, and they are totally inextricable, and you have to work together with them. Um, another area is marketing. If anybody works with advertising or marketing people, uh, is huge privacy issues. Like I said, the opt-in, opt-out, the cookies. Um, just dealing with consumer data, customer data, making sure that it's all kept up to date and accurate and that you're communicating appropriately. Because the last thing you want is a European regulator down your back saying, you know, why haven't you complied with this uh, EU regulation about notice and consent? And there's a lot of things you have to be careful about. So marketing people, you want to get them on your side. HR people, um, the most sensitive data we have at CA is our employee data. Since we don't really do a lot of consumer uh, sales, uh, it's employee information. We have social security numbers and bank accounts. and So that's really important to make sure that they understand how, how secure that needs to be. Um, 
And then uh, basically it's trying to stay out of the papers. I mean, that's, that's my job is to make sure CIA does not appear on the front page of any newspaper, especially Newsday. Um, they don't always write great things about us. But uh, it's, that's my job, make sure we, we stay out of the paper because reputation, you know, it, that's, that's all it is. If, if you have a breach, um, you know, sales just dive, whether or not it really affects people. And one of the things I will mention about the data breach laws uh, being so complex, uh, it's, we've had a few breaches ourselves, but it's been our vendors. We have not done anything, but it's the third parties that with, um, with whom we, we work, like our health care provider. I won't mention the name, but they had an issue uh, where they sent an unencrypted email with people's names on it. They meant to send it to us, and they sent it to someone else, another customer of theirs. Harmless. They didn't mean to do anything. It was an accident. You know, nobody was acting, you know, maliciously. The third party that got the email immediately contacted them and said, we got this email. It's not for us. It was for CA. You know, I'm deleting it. You'd think, you know, okay, no harm. Nothing was done. You don't have to do anything. Not so. It took many days and a lot of hours to go through the statutes, understand, because there are still some states that don't have the harm threshold. Um, like Bill mentioned, you know, there are some states that say if somebody accessed your information, that's a data breach and you have to provide notice. And then the question is, okay, well, if it's only those three states that, who had employees in, listed in there, then I could just notify those people in those three states. But that's not the case either because it looks really bad when you just notify some people and not notify everyone. And it's, although you're not required to notify in a lot of those states, the thought process seems to be recently, you know, the last couple of years, is if you're going to notify anybody, you notify everybody. And then you say, okay, well, that's all right, so I'll just send notices to everybody. But it's not that simple either because every notice has to be different. You know, there's some notices that um, you, you have to specify certain things. So it, there's like five different varieties of notice. Some you have to notify the attorney general as well as the state police, and then you have to notify the consumer protection groups. And it's really, I'll just say it's a nightmare. So, <laughs> so even, if you're act, even if you do everything right, you're still going to have a data breach. It's, the odds are against you, know, against you. If you think you're not going to have a breach, you are going to have a breach. So be prepared, um, you know, have those letters ready, have outside counsel engaged, because I do use outside counsel in those instances, mm -hmm. and um, just do everything you can to prevent it, because it's, it's really a nightmare. Uh, and, you know, Ken had mentioned just about everything I do. So, um, you know, just training, I'll mention training. I don't know if you mentioned training. Uh, employees are the biggest source of, of uh, data breaches and of incidents, security incidents. They pick up the phone and they trust whoever's on the phone and they give them their passwords. You know, employees just, just are trusting people. So it's important to train, train, train all the time. We do, um, we're rolling out like an, an awareness campaign. You can't just have like a once, once a year thing anymore where people have to sit and listen and they, you know, they click through and they're doing their, you know, iPod at the same time. You got to have a whole awareness campaign throughout the year where you're explaining to people how important it is that they keep information private and that they don't give away information and that they are, you know, ensuring that all the personal data is protected. So training, pro policies, that's, that's kind of it. I don't know. I think I covered Thank you. You didn't even give me the five-finger warning, sorry. but... You were right on Oh, there. good. So okay. Thank you very much. My goal is that uh, once our next speaker finishes her presentation, um, we will have an opportunity for a discussion among our panelists. Uh, I've got some questions I'd like to ask and certainly open it up to the audience. Um, our last speaker for this panel uh, is one of our, uh, we are very proud of our alumna, uh, my personal alumna, uh, not, that really sounded bad and now I'm online. Uh, <laughs> one of my students, I should say, who has gone on to wonderful things. Uh, Sophia Pesekman is an attorney for IP and privacy at NBTY. She manages, where she manages privacy law and compliance for NBTY's global e-commerce and marketing initiatives. 
Sophia graduated from Toro Law Center, has an undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland College Park. She began her career at NBTY assisting the, gen the Deputy General Counsel of Intellectual Property and Licensing and has expanded her role responsibilities in her roles as legal liaison to NBTY's e-commerce businesses, intern program supervisor, and privacy officer. She's an active member of the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and an avid follower of the Hunton and Williams Privacy and Information Security Law blog. Sophia. Hi, good morning. Um, so I had a little bit of a less traditional route to where I got. As Professor Ezor mentioned, I was a student of his, um, specifically in the Business Law and Technology Clinic, and where I externed was MBTY Incorporated. It's the holding company, and I think most people aren't aware of it, but it's pretty much the holding company of Puritan's Pride Vitamins, Solgar Vitamins, Metrics, Vitamin World, as you probably know at the retail stores. So all in all, the largest vitamin so dietary supplement company in North America. So I had my externship there, and then I continued on through the summer, and stars aligned. I was exceptionally lucky. Somebody was leaving mm -hmm. as I was studying for the bar, and an opportunity arose. And I worked with the IP Deputy Council, General Counsel of uh, Intellectual Property. So I worked with IP, and in-house in general, our role is really it's to assess risk for the company. So before MBTY, because it being a large company, it always had very good, still does, security technologies with regards to encryption, SSL, et cetera. So they were very confident with regards to the security of their data. But a new risk was arising in the sense of marketing initiatives, e-commerce, the UK regulations and the directive. So as the risk evolved and arose, um, there was a need, and my general counsel, seeing the link between intellectual property and privacy, appointed me as privacy officer. I guess I'm technically chief since there's nobody else, but <laughs> I take um, so what did I get handed? Because of all of the various companies and brands that MBTY has under its uh, umbrella, we have varied websites, and the websites vary with regards to their activity. So we have some information-only sites where they don't even collect email addresses. We have some information-only sites where they do collect email addresses just for newsletters, but to tell you where to go buy the product. Then we have our e-commerce sites where we're collecting the name, the address, Thankfully, we tokenize the credit card, so we don't have to deal with credit card information. Um, information is coming in. We have international orders. We have international websites. Some of the international websites are handled by us. Some of the international websites are licensed to our distributors in the particular areas where there's the CCTLD website. So all in all, it's not one nice, clean scheme where you know I could just come in and apply this beautiful strategy and have, you know, everywhere. It was really a matter of taking a step back and kind of understanding where are we and what are we doing and what is my ideal and then trying to evolve that ideal into the practical. So one of the first things that I did was the privacy policy and the terms of use, because that is really where the consumer sees, oh, I'm sorry, where the consumer sees us and where we interact and where a lot of the risk evolves. So working with outside counsel, we tried to come up with a privacy policy that would cover pretty much the most extensive website, the one that's the most active, collecting the most kinds of information, have the, I guess, one covering everything, and then work back from there with regards to the less active websites. Um, and as Bonnie mentioned, having friends in marketing, in IT, in HR, in the different business units is extremely helpful because us in legal, unless it comes to us, we don't know about it. So I don't know how the Holland and Barrett website in the UK is handling its customer information and whether it's on our systems or it's in a cloud. Like, these are not things that we know beforehand. So 
First was the information gathering portion, and then it was really coming up with the privacy policy. And then you have to also handle the fact that as soon as you're done with your wonderful, beautiful privacy policy, out come these new best practices, and now they recommend that it's layered. So it's a very, it's a very difficult act and, 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 and a role to be in because you're really you're juggling an evolving field where there are really, the law keeps evolving, and in spite of the fact that you can point to something in a book, you have your business people telling you, well, nobody's enforcing it. And I found an article on this, and it's saying that, like, in spite of the fact that they're saying this, they're not really enforcing it, so do I really have to do it? Or X competitor is doing it, so why can't I? So that's one, that's pretty much where we started. Um, having that, that's the aspect, the one aspect. The second aspect that is very challenging with regards to an evolving company and really evolving websites and the overall, I think they're calling it omni-channel now, landscape is a lot of the things being done before large companies had the advantage of having everything in-house. Um, now it's just not feasible nor is it cost effective to have the servers, the, the, the program writers, the software developers all in-house. So a lot of this is now being really, it's going out to third parties and vendors. So what that means is the risk profile is, is much higher because it's now out of our control. So one of the other issues that we're noticing is that any third party that we really go out to, <clears throat> especially those that are going to be acting within the role of a data processor, so we're the data controller, but they're the data processor, for example, cloud, sort, cloud services. And majority of the contract, you don't really have much issue with. Once you get to the data security, especially the indemnification and the liability, is really when it starts getting a little heated. <coughs> Excuse me. And the issue becomes is, because the risk is rather unknown, and it could range anywhere from $3 million to $100 million, nobody wants to take that risk on. So you're also trying to deal with the business people who want to go to this vendor and want to have this service, along with the legal risk of now having your data and your information being stored and potentially accessed by a third party, wherein if there's a breach, should you be paying for it? Should the other company be paying for it? What about even if they are paying for it, the loss to goodwill and the damage to your brand? <coughs> so these are the other issues that we also are constantly, it, it's, it's a dichotomy where you're really, you want to do best practices and you want to protect the company, but at the same time, you can't stunt growth and, and, and you, you really have to allow your business people to make sales. So that's the other issue that we have with regards to just overall privacy within the realm of what MBTY does. Um, with the respect with employees and employee data, thankfully we've always had very strict and well-followed and well-trained policies. So I have to say we don't really deal, deal all that much with employee sorts of data because thankfully we have good policies in, hand, um, in place. One of the major things that really could either help or could be an exceptional disadvantage to any chief privacy officer, any privacy officer in general, is really, especially in a large corporation, is it's associate awareness. And it's kind of in line with privacy by design, where if, if you have associates where, who are aware of the risk and appreciate the risk and understand why it's there, it makes your life a lot easier, it makes your job a lot easier. The problem is that most don't. Um, most are about the sales. And a lot of people, because this is an evolving law, don't really know the fact that they should be doing this. So in spite of the fact that you know, the, the people that would usually follow laws or, 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 or company policies or et cetera, they're just not aware of the fact that this is something that could be wrong. So one of the major things that we're working on, um, and still in this evolutionary phase, is really it's training, but it's appropriate training to the appropriate party. So HR really just needs to be trained on particular issues with regards to employee data, and that's where most of our sensitive information is because we don't take our consumers' social security numbers. Um, Marketing has a completely different 
focus as, as well because they're more about tracking, cookies, email, opt-in, opt-out. I want to run a contest, um, you know, where people send in their pictures and I want to use those pictures however it is that I can or want. So they have a different focus with regards to privacy. And IT, thankfully we have a great IT team, but IT as well needs to be aware of in spite of the fact that maybe it might be okay, as Bonnie mentioned, you know, in 47 of the states and only three, only three are, you know, might be of an issue, you really can't do that in a large company. So especially that's one of the strategies that we, that we take is that in spite of the fact that maybe 75% of our activities don't require that conservative of, 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 a, of a strategy or initiative, because maybe 25% of our activities do, it's easier and it's better just to have across the board more conservative, especially since the laws are gearing towards that way anyways, as opposed to trying to nitpick to each and every situation because A, it's unmanageable, and B, it's just, it, it, it'll get too confused. So given where NB2I is now, and especially as my role, we're kind of in this wonderful and exciting um, place where we're, we're, we're evolving with the law and we're evolving with our businesses and our businesses are evolving with the technology. So it's really, it's an interesting interplay, but it's very difficult to keep up and it's also very difficult to keep everybody else up to date. But privacy policies are a wonderful way to do so. They're a great vehicle also to start discussion. So in spite of the fact I always tell our, um, the appropriate parties that I have to send it out to, this is a work of fiction. This is something that I drafted assuming that this is what you do. I'm not sure if it really is what you do. Maybe you do it in a different way. Maybe instead of cookies, you also have beacons, beacons and pixels and whatever it is else that you drop. So it's, it's a great conversation starter, and it's a wealth of knowledge going through a privacy policy. Um, and it's also a wonderful way to inform your business associates of the things that are important, why they're important, and the things that they need to watch out for. And the wonderful thing, too, is since we started, I really got appointed, I believe, like about a year ago. And even within the short period of time of a year, you could see that more people within the business are actually coming and asking questions, whereas before, they wouldn't even know that it was a question to be had. So the, the, the law is evolving. Um, I think companies are evolving with it. It's a little more difficult for larger companies and smaller companies, but they are getting there, and it should be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, I have a few, <clears throat> excuse me, opening questions, and then, uh, and we have desk mics, so at least the recording will pick it up. And then I'm happy and would strongly encourage audience members to join in on the discussion. Uh, and for people who may be following along on Twitter, uh, if you want to send a question with the hashtag TuroCLE, we'll see about getting an answer as well. Um, my first question actually refers to uh, someone we heard about earlier uh, this, this morning, uh, Aaron Egan, who is the Chief Privacy Officer of Facebook. And one of the things that she has just done with her colleagues, as of I think last week, is they have launched an Ask the Chief Privacy Officer page on Facebook for its users, where they're encouraging the public to pose questions. Now, they're also certainly not promising to answer all of those questions. But it occurs to me that the role of a general counsel is generally a behind-the-scenes role. You rarely, in good times, know who the general counsel of a company is. It's not, that person is not usually the spokesperson, etc. Not usually the public face. But given how much, in consumer products companies especially, the chief privacy officer is, to a certain extent, an advocate for consumers, at least in the internal discussion, what do you think about the, the benefits or downsides of the chief privacy officer taking a more public role on behalf of the company, either to the media or even to customers, as Aaron has? 
Uh, I think it's a great idea. I'm not in a consumer industry, so <laughs> I can say that because I'm not going to do it. But um, no, I, I Well, you do have customers. <laughs> we do. But uh, I have on our privacy page, I, there's a link if somebody has a question and it comes to me. But uh, as for making it more public, I think that's a great idea. I mean, uh, you know, you need to impress with your customers that you care about their privacy um, and you, you know, you need to gain their trust because with trust comes loyalty and business. So I, I think that's a great idea. Well, it's, it's, um, so yeah, so Facebook is, is essentially doing this, you know, in recognition of the importance of, I mean, this is part of what I had in mind when I mentioned her. This is part of how they're recognizing the importance of transparency and the importance of, of showing that they're making an effort in the face of some criticism by regulators and privacy advocates, some of it, you know, probably unfair or, or, or less fair than others, that they really are trying to take into account what consumers uh, want and, and be transparent. It's, it's an issue that, that we had to deal with at Linden Lab, a smaller platform, but probably very particularly vocal platform because uh, I was often asked to go to, you know, forums and, 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 and speak to what they called the residents of Second Life. There was this whole concept that the world was owned by the people that, that played in it. And it was something that we constantly had to juggle because there's this fear that you're going to be asked a tough question and give the wrong answer. And then you've committed the company and then you've got to retract it and it becomes embarrassing. So it's, it's you know, it takes a very skilled person to be able to, 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 to balance that. Yeah, I agree. Well, first, I don't think my lit the litigation attorney would be very happy with that. Um, it's a great idea in, in theory, um, and assuming that you have your team of HR and IT and marketing sitting there with you on this panel, um, it could be, it is great for transparency, and I think consumers would feel a lot more comfortable. It's really just speaking to what you said is, God forbid you say the wrong thing, and, and, and the risk that you put your company into. And I think that's why most companies don't. <laughs> but the idea is great. Uh, and we'll, certainly we'll see how influential is, uh, that effort is. For, first of all, if anybody outside of this room and a few others even noticed that it happened, uh, I happened to be at a conference that, at which Aaron was speaking about two weeks ago, so I was on the lookout for it. But I haven't seen a lot of, of as much as they're seeing this as a you know, positive thing, they're not doing a whole lot to promote it, which tells you that it, this is a, is a, you know, it, it's a small step, but it's an interesting one. We'll see how the experiment goes. Professor, um, <clears throat> so I'd like to be um, politically incorrect. So I, I think it's appropriate that chief privacy officers um, are private and keep private and maintain the, their corporations out of the public eye as much as possible and protect their corporations. Facebook, next to Google, is the world's largest violator of privacy rights. The reason why the chief privacy officer um, is the face of Facebook is to show the world that, gee, maybe Facebook is a good company, a good corporate citizen, and a good private company. The reason Erin got her job, besides being brilliant, um, is that she's 20 years older than Mark, was the Wall Street and public face, but to say that um, Facebook and privacy uh, should be said in the said same sentence is like saying Google and privacy should be said in the same sentence. I, I appreciate the perspective. I, I'm not, you know, I think that there's, there's merit in that. Um, it, I, I, I find it, I, I personally as someone who even as an in-house counsel earlier in my career, because I was, I like being in front of an audience. I did that. It was, it was an atypical thing. Um, but there's a certain amount of, whether it's done by the chief privacy officer or other sorts of communications, transparency is at the heart of so much of the best practices. It is at the heart of the fair information practice principles. It is the watchword of advocates, the idea that whatever the company's practices, and they may be broad they may be narrow, the consumers or whomever's providing the information can actually know and make an informed choice. And so that also becomes part of the chief privacy officer's responsibilities, whether it's done through well-written privacy policy disclosures or ask the privacy chief privacy officer, et cetera. Um, when 
does a company need a chief privacy officer? Well, Sophia, you said you talked a little bit about the evolution of that. To a certain extent, there's a point where a company needs a general counsel. But if we have audience members who are either counsel to corporations, outside counsel or in-house counsel or other professionals, what signs are there that this role should now be formalized within the company? With regards to MBTY, it was the business activity started warranting it. However many years ago, the e-commerce sites weren't collecting as much information as they are now. They weren't email targeting. They weren't going so heavy into behavioral advertising or at least even trying to segment their consumers. So it was really the evolution of the business in the sense that the more privacy-related their activities became, the more the need arose. For us, it was mostly through the e-commerce, our traditional brick-and-mortar or national brand equivalents or anything of that nature wasn't really that big of a deal. It was really a matter of our e-commerce sites just kind of vamping everything up. Bonnie, I know you weren't the first chief privacy officer at CA, but you were certainly among the first. Were you? I thought Andrew was. Somebody else was doing some privacy before me, but there actually didn't have a title. Fair enough. I sort of lobbied to get myself a title because I do think it's important for... Is it on? No, it's on. Okay. There we go. Sorry. I kind of lobbied to get this position, not for my own ego, but really because I think in order for the position to be taken seriously, it helps to have a title with the word officer in it. And in this role or any role where there's a lot of risk, you need people to pay attention. You need people to take it seriously. So I thought that helped with the executive management team. Those are also people that you need to befriend, aside from all the other groups that we mentioned. But you need the executive staff to have respect for the position and for what it stands for, or they'll just not pay attention because they're too busy with other things. So I think it's important to have that title or a similar title. It doesn't have to be that same thing, but something that shows that this is important to the company. And also from the outside, it makes consumers aware that, oh, you have a person that has this position. It's not just one of their many other jobs. This is what they do. It also helps to show consumers and customers that this is important to you. Yeah, I think it's actually probably, in a sense, companies have more signals than they used to have about when it's time because data systems, information systems are so integrated across platforms that they get signals. And two signs are just functionally you're dealing with so much data that you need someone to shepherd it, or you're in an industry that just places so much business risk on messing up that people start asking you, do you have a chief privacy officer, if you get asked that. I mean, it's an informal test, but if you start getting asked that a lot, you should probably have a chief privacy officer. So I think that chief privacy officer is a very important role at corporations. Not every corporation can afford general counsel or a designated CPO. One of the takeaways today, I think, though, is that every business, no matter how small, should have someone with the role of being in charge of privacy and being aware of privacy, no matter how large or small the business. Privacy is something that every company today, whether they just do credit card swiping, ought to be aware of. Certainly a company that is as involved and able to afford a CPO ought to have one. It's very important. But all of us, all of you in your own businesses, really ought to be thinking about privacy all the time. Are there questions from the audience? Yes, and as before, I will repeat it.
things go in the other direction, both the inside out, but also The question from our audience member has to do with uh, the rise of BYOD, bring your own device policies and programs within companies. Uh, and even, I, I would add, people who are just simply using company-issued devices for both personal and professional use. Uh, in litigation, those devices may become owned or otherwise, may become part of electronic discovery, and the data become intermingled. So what are, how are you seeing that and dealing with employee personal information unrelated to the workplace that ends up one way or the other within the workplace uh, purview? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's one that we're dealing with right now at CA because people have been bringing their own devices. They've been using iPads and things that were not issued by the company, um, and we have been allowing them to get on the network, which raises some security issues as well. Our IT team hates it, but you know, if the executives want to do it, they're going to do it. So, and then we allow it, and then more people are doing it, and it just becomes a, an issue, and people are, are doing it. So now we said, well, okay, we can't really stop it. This is the way the world is going, and we have to go with it. We're a technology company. We can't say, no, you can only use this device. People have four or five devices, and they have to be connected. But um, what we do is, is we're writing policies around it and make sure that employees know that if they are bringing their own information onto, per, onto our network, we are going to have access to that information. We, are, we may need to go through it for litigation purposes. Um, we also may need to wipe their devices. Um, that's another area that's a big issue in Europe. Um, you know, with our European employees, do we have the right to wipe their devices? But, you know, if we don't, then that means people are taking these devices when they leave CA, and there could be potentially a lot of confidential um, CA information on those devices, and they're taking them right out with them, which we can't have either. So as, a, uh, as an incentive to allow them to bring their own devices, we say, well, we will wipe them when, we t when your employment terminates. Um, sometimes you kind of have to assume the risk of certain things in order for the greater whole to be better. Um, you know, so that wiping thing may be an issue in, in a country in Europe, but it's better for CA as a whole to know that our data is, is not going out into the, you know, the world after the person leaves CA. Um, litigation is a big issue with legal hold notices and, um, you know, information that's on those machines. We do need to be able to find that if we are in litigation and we have uh, discovery that uh, we need to go into those devices. So that's another thing you need to tell the employee. We may, if you want to connect to the network, we may need to go into your device and find that stuff. It's, it's an ugly world. Um, it's, a, it's very complicated, and nobody really has the right solution for it yet, but we're working on that. It, it raises a lot of issues. I don't know, maybe somebody here has the answer, and I'll talk to you after about it. <laughs> well, I, I don't have the, an the answer. <laughs> but, but one thing I would say is it's, 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 I, I think it's generally easier for a company to secure data and databases than it is to secure devices. And one thing that that companies, I mean, when I was at the, the Attorney General and we did a lot of investigations into unauthorized access of, of, uh, of data, in fact, we wrote that New York law that sometimes I wish I could take back. But, um, but one thing that we found, and I see it you know, now, is that a lot of companies don't safeguard sensitive data for whatever reason across their employee base in the way that they perhaps should. And often it's built into contracts that, you know, you're not supposed to access uh, certain data uh, if you're a vendor, except on a need-to-know basis. But nonetheless, you know, for cultural reasons that they don't want to create kind of a multi-tier system where certain engineers have access to customer data and certain don't, or simply for expediency that you don't have to, want to have to go through this additional credentializing process when you know a new person joins the team, there are lots of um, people who have access to sensitive data who probably shouldn't. So, the the best thing that a company can do is you know to the extent that it's feasible, res simply restrict the number of people who have access to sensitive data to to really some sensible need to know basis. That's 
Um, not to be too redundant after what Bonnie said, but we pretty much do the same thing. We have a uh, BYOD policy where um, in order to get the email on your own device, you need to have IT do it for you. When they do, you need to have to sign the policy. Um, they also, a lot of times, I don't know what the software name is, but I know that they download certain software where they can wipe but just their information right. as opposed to your personal information. But the policy obviously says that, you know, if we end up wiping your information, you're okay with it. Um, we also have, especially, I think that there's other software where um, it forces passwords. So you have to have a password after a certain amount of time. It'll just lock and you need to have a password or else you can't have the software on it. Um, with regards to our network, um, if you're going to, it's one thing to just have wireless, wireless but if you're actually going to get into anything, and you have to VPN in. Um, so there's specific software that IT has to put onto your device. So going with that, um, they already have a lot of safeguards, but same as you, it's really, it's a policy. You can't really control what people do or, you know, how they handle that information. It's an assumed risk because that's just the way the world's going. Good. Uh, other question from the audience. Yes, please. The question is a follow-up to our discussions. It's a practical one. Uh, once an employee leaves, uh, an employee who perhaps might have, during the course of employment, copied, downloaded emails and other corporate records out of the company, how can wiping a device help? Well, an, I mean, I'll, uh, if it's an employee that has access to employee records, uh, then that, that employee, no one who's outside of HR should have access to, to employee records in the first place. So, so this isn't a direct answer, but the, it kind of goes to my last point about, you know, segmenting the data. I mean, you know, there's probably no reason for anyone except the, the legal team to have access to certain contracts, no reason for people other than HR to have access to uh, you know, to certain, to, to, to most employee records. You could do this even in, even if you've got a, a, a fairly open system like Dropbox, it's very easy to create access uh, controls. Um, once, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, then, you know, you have to often get lawyers involved. If, if the employee is not going to um, uh, be responsive, you're going to have to probably, uh, you know, have, have, uh, you know, someone um, do tests on the on the hard drive to see what data the employee might have emailed out. Well, while you know, while at work, it becomes quite expensive. Well, uh, I am actually, with with permission, going yeah. to to respond. So the the follow up was isn't the only way to block that, um, to, it, the only way to prevent it, to block employees from emailing to personal emails? And the short answer is no. Um, and this is not a new problem. That is, people have been taking confidential stuff from companies as long as there have been employees. <laughs> the big difference, the big difference is that 50 years ago, if you, want, if you worked for a big retailer, and wanted to steal all of its credit card records or all of its customer accounts, you would need a truck or two trucks and a warehouse of your own and a lot of photocopying time. Today, uh, you know, I have my little device here. It's a cell phone. And inside my cell phone is, well, I can't pop both up, so I don't want to lose it, um, is a micro SD chip card that is about this big, and for the purposes of the camera, uh, that holds 64 gigabytes of data. We're walking around with storage that was government level 20 years ago. Uh, biggest companies only. You know, I have a, an SD, uh, a USB stick on my keychain. So you cannot prevent it. And it is much easier. You can limit original access to those sensitive data. You can instill a corporate culture um, and you can watch after an employee leaves, particularly if there's a, 
question about that employee's motives to see what happens with those data. Do they show up somewhere else? Well, then you may be able to track them to that particular person. Uh, it's probably of greater importance, though, to consider issues of access in uh, to data by former employees, dis disgruntled employees. You cannot prevent, any more than realistically, you can prevent people from accessing social networks at work as long as they have cell phone signals. You can block it on your own network, but they can do it through their phones. So you have to think about realistic risk assessment. There will always be risk. Balancing it, ensuring against it, um, and making sure that there's enough awareness across the enterprise as to what the stakes are so that people aren't going to accidentally do things to damage the enterprise. Uh, we have time for one more question because we do want to get you guys uh, moving. Yes, please. I was just going to say. Yeah, there's data loss prevention technology right. as well that can detect uh, certain types right. of files from going over and can quarantine. The, the, the comment was that you can lock documents once they leave the enterprise, but that assumes that the documents weren't printed or photographed off a screen or everything else. I, what All I want to suggest here is not, not to use technology. It would be rather hypocritical of me. Um, but rather, with this as in other things, Technology is one tool, it has certain powers, it has certain limitations. And one should neither ignore it nor rely too heavily upon it to do something it's simply unable to do. And there are also technologies, of course, that, that will scan, I mean, they're expensive and they're cumbersome, but they'll scan, um, they'll scan traffic. And if they pick up certain you know, bits and bytes that are leaving the system, they'll pick that up. And then, of course, outsource, outsource platforms, um, in other countries have, have systems that lock documents where you can't print them. But that, I mean, it's, it's expensive, it's cumbersome, and it, it sometimes detracts from the culture. And so it's and I, I will leave downsides uh, this it. portion of the discussion, and it actually leads nicely into mine, uh, uh, with an observation that an early high-tech lawyer I knew was involved in very sensitive mergers and acquisitions had two computers in his office one connected to the internet, one connected to the firm's network. Which, and it forced him, and he forced himself, to be very careful about which documents he was copying onto the machine to send out to avoid the accidental breaches. And more than any malice, the vast majority of problems with the misuse of data um, or even the, the inaccurate privacy policies come down to accident, misunderstanding, just non-malice. Um, and those are the hardest things to get around. And those, that's really where training comes in. Uh, for those on the stream, we are taking a 10-minute break. For those in the room, we are taking a 10-minute break. Uh, we will resume for the final session, the ethics session, uh, at uh, 11.25 and a half. Uh, and if you, if for people who might be leaving early, I want to publicly thank uh, Barbara Hakimi, who is our coordinator of CLE. Peter Sinisi, our Associate Dean of Information Technology, Linda Howard Weissman, the Development Office, for making this possible. So thank you to them. <coughs> thank you again for uh, attending today and for participating so actively. Uh, if you missed it or you want to join in the conversation, which is actually a fairly active one, on Twitter, the relevant hashtag is TuroCLE. Um, Sure. For our final presentation today, I want to take a little bit of a different uh, focus. We've heard from really excellent uh, leading speakers this morning on the work that lawyers do, or chief privacy officers do, to help others with privacy compliance through counseling and advising and perhaps writing policies and everything else. But what we shouldn't lose sight of is that we as lawyers, and those of you who aren't lawyers in the audience, the lawyers next to you, are ourselves responsible for compliance too. And specifically for privacy compliance. 
both within our ethical obligation to keep client information confidential, but also, as I'll discuss, through some of the other privacy laws that are out there. And sometimes we face some more challenges because we're so used to keeping things secret that we don't always remember which things must be kept, let's call it extra secret, because of additional laws. And so for the next CLE hour, um, I'm going to talk about the ethics issues that we face, the compliance issues that we as lawyers face, and how, what we can be doing about it. No, no surprises here. We've heard today electronic communications are crucial for all business people. Lots of different channels. And in business, I'm also talking not just about for-profit organizations, but not-for-profit organizations, uh, also non-profitable organizations, but that's a different story. But any of us who are dealing with the world, we're deal using these tools. We have to. Email, text messages, websites, video conferencing, as we are today, social media, as we also are today, and there are others. And these channels can be one way, we broadcast or we receive, can be two way, or they can be multi-point, such as the media we're using today. And with those common tools come some common challenges. Addressing and attachment errors. Every time I talk about this, I, I'm not going to bother you guys today, but I, talk about, I ask audience members, how many have never either sent the right email but put the wrong attachment on it, or sent the right document but sent it to the wrong person. I can tell you that the numbers of people who raised their hands having never done it, and I'm certainly not one, <laughs> uh, at most in a big room is going to be two. It's just too easy to do. There's the lack of nuance and tone in some of these technologies. It's very hard to be subtle in 140 characters. It's difficult to necessarily recognize humor. Sometimes it's not very good humor. But a sarcastic tone of voice is very much more illustrative than, oh, I don't know, a colon, a hyphen, and a, and a per closed parenthesis, a smiley. So you lose a certain amount of nuance, and there could be misunderstandings. Here's one that I know we all deal with, the heightened expectations of responsiveness. Your check is in the mail is from the Stone Age now. These soon Saturday mail will also be in the Stone Age. Uh, but clients, customers, colleagues, bosses expect us to be always on instantaneously responding, even when what they're asking really still takes time to do right. But there is that heightened expectation of responsiveness. There is an informality, especially when you're bringing your own device. These media do not lend themselves to to whom it may concern, very truly yours. Um, and sometimes a business communication won't sound that way, uh, won't be received that way. And many industries face compliance challenges. Financial services sector, healthcare. Many, many industries have specific rules about archiving communications, things that are and are not permitted, companies that are about to do initial public offerings, have a quiet period that can be breached by the wrong person mentioning the company's name in a Facebook posting. So these are common issues. And to make them work, all enterprises deal with management concerns, licensing, training, more training, dealing with the problems. But that's, those are the universal issues. We are special. For better or for worse, we are special. We have formal rules of professional conduct, or whatever the state equivalent might be. We have written behavior rules that apply to us not only in our practices, but outside our practices. As long as we are licensed by the state, its rules apply to everything that we do. Just ask a few former presidents who left office only to face bar proceedings 
because their conduct as presidents was seen as violating the rules, even though they weren't seeing a single client. We have to worry about these issues, and our use of communications tools and technology tools is no different. And in order for us to retain our licenses, avoid malpractice, avoid sanctions, and just be good lawyers, we have to comply with those rules and all of the good business practices that everyone else has. And in this context, the issue that we face is compliance with confidentiality more than anything else. The ABA, the American Bar Association, recognizes this, has been looking at these new challenges for some time. In September of 2010, the American Bar Association, uh, its Commission on Ethics 2020, issued a white paper concerning client confidentiality and lawyers' use of technology, seeking comments into what might need to be changed in the model rules of professional conduct to reflect these new ways of communicating and new possibilities of breaching client confidence. And so if you look now, post that process, and 1.6c in New York is somewhat different, but if you look at model rule number 1.6c, we have this brand new additional statement about confidentiality specifically arising out of technology. <clears throat> a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of or unauthorized access to information relating to the representation of a client. All the things that we've heard about today. Leaked information, data breaches, outsourced data, that, data services that have been insecure, data walking away on hard drives or phones. Those are now our responsibilities. Implicitly, they probably always were. But explicitly now, we, we must take reasonable efforts to prevent, not just prohibit, the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure or unauthorized access to the accidental stuff that happens precisely because of technology. And the ABA is very clear in its original proposal about this. It talks about how technology is great. It can reduce the cost of service, increase its quality, increase access to legal services. But lawyers need to understand, writes the ABA, that technology can pose certain risks to clients' confidential information and that reasonable safeguards are ethically required. Keep that in mind. The ABA is saying, now of course, the American Bar Association doesn't enforce ethics rules, but it writes them and its, its views about what it's writing very influential. And the ABA is saying here that firewalls and encryption and proper data policies are ethically required. Technology decisions ethically required. So that is the state of 1.6, which is pretty much where you would find that in any of the states, including New York, that follow the model rules. And we'll revisit some of those ethical issues. But as I said at the outset, we are subject as well to the laws that generally cover privacy. We have to balance our obligations of confidentiality that arise in the law and in our ethics with potential for disclosure obligations. We have to tell people sometimes what information we are sharing, and the answer will be no. But think about what a law firm privacy policy is going to say on its website. The following is, is what we do with the information we collect from you. Yes, lawyers are doing that too. One interesting place where this came up was specifically in the context of financial privacy. When the graham leach bliley law was passed in 1999, deregulating certain banking uh, practices, it also brought with it new financial privacy rules. Not nearly as strong as those for consumer privacy, or children's privacy rather, or health privacy but restrictions not only on the use of account information and sharing, 
uh, and the establishment of an opt-out for marketing, but an annual notice requirement between the law and the regulations that were passed under it. An annual requirement for those businesses in financial services to send a letter to their customers. Dear customers, the following sets forth the conditions under which we will share the information we have collected from you. Statutorily or regulatory required disclosure. And lawyers who, financial services is very broadly defined. And tax lawyers and corporate lawyers and real estate lawyers and estate planning lawyers suddenly realize they might have to send a letter every year to every client that started out with, dear client, this is how the way that we will share the information we collect from you. And whatever the next sentence is, this would be a problem. So the American Bar Association, on behalf of its members, went to the Federal Trade Commission and said, are we responsible for this? This didn't really mean us, did it? And the FTC said, we can't say. There's no guidance in the statute that tells us one way or the other that a lawyer, we understand the argument, but we cannot, <coughs> under what we have in the statute, determine what, whether or not this is supposed to pro apply to you. And the American Bar Association then brought a federal lawsuit against the FTC seeking and ultimately receiving a declaratory judgment in the district, of, of, in the district Court of the District of Columbia in 2005 that exempted lawyers from the Graham, Leach, Bliley privacy disclosures. So we don't have to send these letters. But it wasn't necessarily clear. And there are others. If we are doing regular billing, we keep up payment information on account with our clients, and we regularly bill them, we may fall under the FTC's red flags rule. A regulation that requires businesses that do that to do an annual self-check a regular self-check about where there might be identity theft risks, red flags of potential exposure to identity theft. If a law firm collects information online and one of the fields that it asks about is age, I mean, you can imagine what kind of law firm information queries, maybe it's elder care law or some other where, where the age of the person is relevant to whether the firm can serve the person or not. The firm asks for age, and some precocious 11-year-old goes onto this elder care stat, uh, website and fills out the form accurately, including her age. Well, guess what? That firm has now knowingly received personally identifiable information from a child under the age of 13 without verifiable parental consent. So we heard from Bill earlier, violation of federal law. It's not what they're thinking about. Most law firm sites don't appeal to children, but the flip side, the knowingly, potentially does. And so, in theory, the firm has to consider COPPA, and that may become a website design issue. Securities laws, lawyers who work for publicly traded firms are under, particularly under the Sarbanes-Oxley law, have a real challenge of balancing their lawyer, legal obligations to disclose, to, to keep things confidential with some of Sarbanes-Oxley's requirements to disclose. But would they also face the same issues of the quiet period for IPOs, et cetera. And lawyers can, cause problems that way just as easily. Um, data retention rules that apply to the securities industry can apply to lawyers as well. Uh, there may be a non-disclosure agreement in a contract, keeping information confidential. Now, you might say, quite reasonably, well, we're good at that. We're used to keeping things confidential. But here's where I think we have a potential for risk, one of the areas. If you take a typical non-lawyer business person and, excuse my mic uh, he or she generally doesn't deal with secret stuff, sensitive information. And that person, it's like she's put on a deal that is really hush-hush. 
Every document is going to be stamped confidential, do not share, and that's going to catch that person's attention because it's unusual. That person will make sure, we hope, to take those extra precautions. But for lawyers, everything is effectively stamped that way. So the things that are more sensitive because of additional laws might not catch the extra attention. And so while we're always, we can always slip, talk about the wrong thing in an elevator, accidentally send the wrong email message, we're probably more casual about the secrecy thing because we do it all the time. It becomes routine, and with routine comes lack of focus. So it's important to just remind ourselves of this in this context. So let's focus now on some of the risk areas, the places where in our businesses we might violate whether it's our ethics rule or statutory rule just by being lawyers doing what we do. We've heard some today discussions of cloud and remote storage. Sort of in what's old is new again. Because before we all had computing devices that we could put on our desks or keep in our pockets, those that needed computing services shared them through terminals remotely. And before we all had affordable hard drives, we shared them. But then we all got our own. And now there are still these efficiencies of scale and software as a service. And we're back to using some sort of cloud storage or cloud-hosted uh, email services. Anyone who attended Legal Tech last week saw lots of cloud references, some cute new companies with cloud names. But a lot of stuff is being stored remotely. And so we connect, whether it's through our phones or our tablets or our laptops or our desktops or, God forbid, the business center in a hotel. We, collect, we connect to these services remotely. And we have to remember the ethical concerns not only how we are using them, but the reality of who else has access. You hear a radio commercial for a, a remote backup service, and it will say, it's encrypted, it's secure, but how do you verify that, and do you need to, in order to fulfill your ethical obligations? Your own as well as theirs. How do you deal with this challenge that you no longer, your IT colleagues no longer control house the places where your data are stored? And are they reliable? Mm -hmm. One of the things we have to do is keep our client records and have access to them. And as a storm bears down on us, we remember the lessons of Sandy when it comes to that. New York State Bar in September of 2010 was asked this question. Are we ethically allowed as lawyers to use remote online storage providers to store client confidential information? And the short answer was yes. Provided, goes the digest, that the lawyer takes reasonable care to ensure that confidentiality will be maintained in a manner consistent with the lawyer's obligation under Rule 1.6. Again, in addition, the lawyer should, should stay abreast of technological advances to ensure that the storage system remains sufficiently advanced protect the client's information and should monitor the changing laws of privilege to ensure that storing the information online will not cause loss or waiver of any privilege. One more ethics body telling us, telling those of you that don't enjoy reading about the latest technological development, that you are now ethically obligated to do it if you want to take advantage of these or any such technologies. Not just stay up on the laws of privilege but technological advances. Massachusetts Bar, just this past year, same question, similar answer. So it is permitted so long as the lawyer undertakes reasonable efforts to ensure that the provider's terms of use and data privacy policies, practices, and procedures are compatible with the lawyer's professional obligations, including the obligation to protect client, confidential client information. And actually says that the lawyer shouldn't do it for sensitive information without getting prior client consent. So we're put in a position where, at least in the opinion of these advisory ethics opinions, 
we have to verify the security of the services we use, which is a practical impossibility. Right? Where are they located? What country are they located in, let alone what state? Who runs them? How do we know the promises are being kept? One service that we've heard about today, one service that I use, is Dropbox. It is pervasive. If you've read The Lean Startup, it's one of the examples in The Lean Startup. Um, it's a great service. It's basically a remote hard drive that you can share. I'm using Dropbox to share the documents from today's thing. But while Dropbox is usually password protected, in June of 2011, Dropbox confirmed this afternoon, wrote Declan McCullough in, in CNET, that a programmer's error caused a temporary security breach that allowed any password to be used to access any user account. Oops. We, and this is, generally speaking, held to be one of the most reliable, professional, verifiable services. The fact that we know this helps to prove that. So business people generally needed to worry about that. We are doubly concerned because we have both ethical obligations and the rest of the obligation about confidentiality. And are we set up to use these services in a way, such as encrypting our files before we put them there, that both benefits, takes the benefit of these services, but also deals with our ethical and legal obligations. We travel. We work everywhere. I'm sure half of you are working right now. Um, multitasking is a great thing. I have a t-shirt that says, at work if awake. And I think we all understand that, right? So we are mobile by desire or by mandate. We are working at home. We are working on the train. We are working in an auditorium. We are working on quote unquote vacation. And we are carrying around huge amounts of client data. I'm old enough to remember the brief bag era, the red weld era. You could bring home to work whatever you could manage to carry with you. Not anymore. Now we're bringing home the file room. Is that me buzzing? All right, I'm going to lose this mic and go back to the other one. Um, I don't need to buzz. There we go. All right. Uh, so we're carrying around huge amounts of sensitive client information. Some we need at the moment. Others, it's just there. You have your last months or two months of emails with all the documents or on your thumb drive or whatever else it is. These things are, I will ask the question, how many of you have lost or had stolen a phone? Ooh, oh, we have a few. Okay? Think about all the people who unfortunately were made homeless and had their homes and businesses destroyed again in the recent storm. Think of all their computers that were just sitting there. These things are easily lost or stolen. I'm not going to ask this publicly. But I'd like you to think about which among you have not set your portable devices so that they automatically require a password after either every time or after a certain amount of time. I'm sure that there's one or two of you that have not taken that step, which means that anybody who steals your device, as long as they keep it charged, has open access. If you put the password on, then if it's not found for 10 minutes or 5 minutes or whatever, it locks. And most modern devices, if you put in the wrong password a few times, they'll erase themselves. But if you haven't taken that minimal step, you know, it's, it's like leaving a brief bag in the middle of, t of Grand Central Station. We also use unsecured home or public wireless networks. I'm confident in the quality of our network here, but I'm certainly not promising um, that it is completely invulnerable. We do a really good job. But if you go to Panera Bread or Starbucks or the airport or next door to your neighbor's house, um, 
you may find open wireless. Oh, I have to get something done. Who's listening in? It is insanely easy for those with the technical tools, not even the skill, but the tools, to listen in on network traffic. Sometimes what looks like a public network is actually set up specifically to listen in. A uh, computer security expert once said at a conference I was attending that the best way to do corporate espionage is to park outside a senior executive's house and just listen in on the likely unsecured wireless network. Are your home networks secured when you do work? Are all the networks you use? Are you using a virtual private network for everything that you do? And then the worst. I, I talked about it earlier. This gives me hives metaphorically speaking. The hotel business center. If I wanted to do corporate espionage, I'd buy a hotel. Or rather, I'd just take the franchise for the business center in the lobby of a hotel. Because people who don't want to schlep around their devices check their emails, print out documents, and God only knows, well, God and whomever looks, only knows what information is left on those devices. Those computers. Uh, a former employer of mine, it was a, a secure business printing business was started because the founder walked past a copy shop and saw tax returns in the dumpster. That was hard copy. There are cases, really influential cases, about temporary files left on computers. We use uh, not just public computers. When we were stuck in the storm, we might have gone to a friend's house to do some work on their machines. What did we leave on those machines? We don't know. Then we get to email, which, as we've heard correctly, has become an absolutely essential business tool for all of us. It's unheard of that we don't have email. If we're young enough, we've given up on email. But the rest of us and our clients, it's unheard of. Now, email is not in itself a secure technology. And the question had to be asked. Was email to be treated for ethics purposes, for privilege purposes? Right? Confidentiality is the general obligation. Privilege is something owned by the client. And I, I have someone who teaches evidence in the room. I don't want to get this wrong. Um, in the context of a legal procedure. But privilege can be defeated if there isn't a subjective, reasonable expectation of privacy. Postcards, generally speaking, are not privileged. Dear lawyer, having a wonderful time, killed the person, love client. <laughs> Lawyer-client communication, not privileged. Sealed envelope, would be, most likely. Fax with a cover sheet, generally speaking, privileged. Telephone calls, they can be listened in on, but it's illegal. Reasonable expectation of privacy, privilege. What about email? The way email works, it sits on service provider machines, it goes through, it waits for a while. It's potentially interceptable. Well, back in 1999, the American Bar Association, what was then its Standing Committee on Ethics and Professional Responsibility, issued formal opinion number 99-413, and thank goodness it did. Because that opinion said, a lawyer may transmit opinion, information relating to the representation of a client by unencrypted email, email that didn't itself have to be scrambled, the contents of it, sent over the internet without violating the rules, model rules of professional conduct because the mode of transmission affords a reasonable expectation of privacy from a technological and legal standpoint. And it, and it compares it to US and commercial mail, landline telephonic transmissions, and facsimiles it said landline because back in 1999, cell phones weren't scrambled in digital encryption, encrypted, and you could listen in. These days, I would think that cell phones would be counted at too. So things don't have to be perfect. It just has to be a reasonable expectation of privacy to preserve the privilege. That was 1999, and it's a good thing that was true because then, as now, routinely encrypting email between lawyer and client is essentially impossible. Even within a company, but certainly outside. Although the methods have been known and standardized for years, the tools of 
of universally encrypting the message itself are still techie level and require that every single person in the communications chain uses the same digital certificate technologies, exchanges public and private keys, has those tools available on every device on which that person wants to read those messages, and go on and on. Some of you are into this, most of you are beginning to glaze over, and I don't blame you. Email remains not consumer friendly to encrypt. So thankfully, the ABA influentially said, we don't have to in order for privilege to be preserved. It doesn't mean confidentiality, right? The email can still be intercepted, read, missent, et cetera, and the information can get out, but it wouldn't be admissible. It would still be protected by the privilege. Yeah, well, maybe. Until Scott versus Beth Israel, here in New York, 2007. This was a case where a client was emailing his lawyer while at work about a case expected against the employer. The client left the position or was fired. The case was commenced. Hospital discovers, oh, look, this email is on our system. Are we permitted to use it in the litigation? Doctor and his lawyer said, wait a minute. No, of course not. Attorney-client communication, right? That's one of those easy ones. No. Because the doctor used his work email. And because the work email system came, brought with it a policy where as a condition of using the work email, employees agreed that the employer had the right and they acknowledged that had the ability to read employee emails, which employers routinely request the right to do to make sure email is being used for the right purposes. And as a result of that policy, even though this was very pure, clearly a lawyer-client communication, no question about it, the reasonable ex expectation of privacy, though, was not there. And the hospital was given permission to disregard potential privilege and use the email. So suddenly, we lawyers have to think not only, you know, are we, are we getting email from our client, but what email system is our client using? Because some will be privileged and some won't. It's like trying to figure out what telephone your client is from. And even if we want to say to our clients, don't email me from work, wherever, public system, what about the first one that comes? Dear lawyer, here I am at the office, and, you know, I've just sexually harassed someone, or I've just stolen this, or I'm being sexually harassed, but it, it really doesn't bother me. What do I do? Love client. And that email, fair game potentially, even though it's client to lawyer about a legal matter. There's a similar case in California. But going back to this issue of temporary files, there is the Stengard case in New Jersey. Not so dissimilar fact pattern, client emailing lawyer from work about lawsuit with work, left lawsuit. The difference, though, is a technical one. Instead of using her work email, Stengard accessed her Yahoo mail from work. Now, the transmission to a web-based email is generally scrambled. They couldn't listen in the company. But because it was web-based, there were temporary files left on the laptop. And when Loving Care took back the laptop and checked it out and scanned it, they found this, this message. And the trial court said what the Scott versus Beth Israel trial court said. You have it. Work computer, no reasonable expectation of privacy in a work computer. It's not privileged. It took for the New Jersey, first the, the appeals level and then the Supreme Court to uphold that in that circumstance with a web-based email, even though the employer, the former employer, had the message, it was not permitted to use it. It was an accident of which system the client used. So we can no longer assume the protection of privilege for our emails, but encryption is still a pain. So we're sort of stuck on this one right now, but we have to remember it. We have to remind our clients, because it's our obligation.
It's their risk, but it's also our obligation. We also have to consider our internal practice IT security. And this is a particular challenge for those practices that don't necessarily have their own dedicated IT staff or a sophisticated one. Uh, this was a story that was related to me personally some years ago, and I'm pleased to tell you honestly, I do not remember from which law firm this came. But it was a firm on Long Island in, again, about seven, eight years ago. And one of the lawyers told me that his firm had decided because it had more internet connectivity than it was using. <clears throat> And it didn't have a lot of traffic to its website. That rather than spending the money host on a hosting company for the firm's website, it would host it inside, just connect it to the firm's internet connection, save some money on the connectivity, easier to manage. They hired somebody to set it up who didn't quite close all the security holes. And then the server started slowing down. Was it working right? And they checked. And apparently, because there was this security hole, in addition to hosting the firm's website, it was also hosting pornography that had been sent to it from Eastern Europe. Happily, I think with the story goes, it was not child pornography, which I suspect would have made the papers. But the fact is that that was, that was as good an outcome as could have it could have been the firm's network, file servers. So all the firm's documents were as accessible as the remaining storage space. It's a really good object lesson in what can happen when you miss the security holes. And we as lawyers worry more about that because of these additional obligations. What about the tools that we use in practice? How can we, without meaning to, breach our obligations of privacy and potentially the laws? about privacy. Well, we heard uh, earlier Paul Rebell talking about how doctor's offices are using black pens to, to, to black out earlier patients, but you can see through it. We call that redaction, right? We're familiar with redaction, whether it's in the context of disclosure and discovery or Freedom of Information Act requests. And in the old days, redaction was literally taking a black pen of some kind Sometimes they would use a razor blade to really be good at it, but taking a black pen, and if you see, remember all those, the Watergate documents or similar things, you see all these black pen lines. Adobe Acrobat offers a similar tool. You have an Acrobat document, you can redact it, make black lines appear, and if you print it, you can't see through it, it's fine. Unfortunately, at least earlier versions of Acrobat, and I'm not sure, I think this has been fixed, but don't rely on me for this. Earlier versions of Acrobat, all they did was change the color of the text and the background to the same color. So when it printed, it was fully black. But if it was stored electronically, you could copy and paste and get it completely. And there were a number of stories about government leaks this way in 2005. In 2009, there was a lawsuit about fate with between Facebook, you would think, they would probably have some sophistication, and connect you. Facebook redacted certain language in a settlement, but they distributed it electronically. The redaction was done electronically, and anyone with the document was able to copy and paste and get the, all the documents. Uh, but we must have gotten better at that. December of 2009, Department of Homeland Security a government document that revealed airport screening secrets got out the same way. Electronically redacted, copy and pasted. Oh, we figured that, right? The Blagojevich case, 2010. Same deal. Electronically re released copies of documents, copy, paste, everything was there. We need to understand, we heard earlier about training. And often, especially for in-house lawyers, the costs of training are seen as unnecessary overhead. This is not the case. This is risk management for law firm lawyers, for in-house lawyers, for other executives. You need to understand how the tools we use work so you don't accidentally send out things you thought were secure or through channels that you thought were secure. And then we come to social media. 
I'm a big Twitter user, no surprise to anybody who's ever met me. Um, and I find a lot of professional value, but that's not this talk. This talk is about how the informality, the ease of use, the fact that it's happening in our phones and our tablets and our laptops, the fact that sometimes it, we could tweet or post to something with a text message, doesn't require a particular software. All of these things combine to make it very easy, way too easy, to breach our privacy obligations as well as severely endanger our reputations, our future hireability, our current employment, our clients' futures through injudicious, if you'll pardon the pun, use of social media. And so I want to really close this uh, with a few fun but scary all real world bad examples that were just findable by public searching. I don't know these people, the vast majority of them. Maybe all of them, I don't know. But I have a running search for people that say my client and law or judge. But I have a running search for people who identify themselves as law students. So I could pick up these bad examples. So let me lead you through a few of these. Here's a lawyer on February 5th, so just a couple of days ago. Judge was visibly irritated at opposing counsel, so I let him ask his argumentative and irrelevant questions of my client without objecting. Now, just put in mind, let's say the client loses based on that testimony convinced the jury. Lawyer, you did not do a good job defending me. You didn't object. Well, maybe I didn't realize. Exhibit A. This lawyer's just admitted to potential malpractice. Now, I understand there's a strategy involved, right, in allowing the other side to hang him or herself. But if things are truly objection-worthy, objection do you really want to be bragging that you just declined? Note to recent law grads, this is from January 13th, January 14th. Read and know the local circuit rules, court rules, before you get embarrassed by the judge during motion hour. It's fine, but now we all know that Joe Duncan doesn't do his homework. He's a lawyer. <laughs> Howard Bailey, I never want to leave another lawyer on the jury because I'm worried the lawyer will see the strings I'm trying to pull defending a client. Litigators in the room, do juries, jurors follow you when, they, when you, they get your name, right? Everyone I've talked to says, yeah, anybody on a jury pool, unless, in a jury, unless they are sequestered in some way, every name they hear in the courtroom, they're going to look at them up at night and follow them. So now, Mr. Bailey, who I suspect is a wonderful lawyer, has not, maybe he doesn't like putting lawyers, but he's just told all the jurors that he's trying to pull strings. Here's a lawyer that has decided to publicly criticize a judge for being late on Twitter. And I always wanted the judge to come in and say, I was spending the last hour following you on Twitter, <laughs> counsel. Chambers, now. Can't imagine the prosecutor uh, would want, would necessarily feel particularly generous towards this lawyer's <laughs> client. This one's interesting. You're not really supposed to tell the jury you're, you're talking about settlements, are you? Because you don't want to prejudice the jury whether or not they should be prejudiced, right? Settlement talks are, are not to be disclosed because you want to encourage settlement. Well, this lawyer didn't say the client, didn't even say, you know, he could have many cases on, on trial. But he's publicly announcing he's in a, another marathon settlement agreement. I'm not saying that's a violation. But it's one of those things, as they say, makes you go, hmm. I like this one. I, for years, have used it as a, as a hypothetical, talking about how just saying where you are can violate client confidence. That a lawyer who worked, say, for a New York-based clothing manufacturer, who, who indicated through his or her online presence that the lawyer was spending a week in Bentonville, Arkansas, in the middle of, of February or March. Anybody who knows anything 
about retail and Bentonville understands that that is the world headquarters, that's where the world headquarters of Walmart is. And a lawyer from New York who's a week in Bentonville without saying anything else is disclosing that he is speaking to Walmart about something. Right? That was my hypothetical. And then I see this on my Twitter feed. Another, apparently it's rush minute for Bentonville traffic. And I have to tell you, I went wild. Until I realized that this is actually Walmart's in-house privacy counsel. But he agreed with me. It had been somebody else. This would have been really revealing. See? That's Anthony Martin. So he was at home. He wasn't saying anything other than he was on his way to his publicly disclosed employer. Here's another lawyer who's saying that she doesn't know how to practice. Now these are not necessarily client information, but they're indicative of how easy it is to disclose things that you shouldn't or you're not permitted to. So just to bring all of this today together, we've got challenges here. Privacy is an ever-shifting area, legally, ethically, and in the mind of the public. It's hard and it's very difficult often to even know what your clients are collecting. Sometimes they themselves aren't fully aware. In my own practice, I've used questionnaires. Said to the client, don't answer now. Don't tell me. Take it back to the office. Talk to IT. Talk to marketing. Talk to finance. Get all of these answers. Then come back and we can craft for you a privacy policy, a disclosure that actually talks about what you're doing. Hard to do. And then we have these challenges of our own. We don't always have control of the tools that we get to use. And even where we do, we may not understand them. So as with everything else, as the issue of employees that can steal data, we have to have awareness, we have to have policies and process together that, and I'm sure the IT folks out there will support this and those who work with them, IT staff needs funding, not only for appropriate tools, but for training themselves and then to be able to share the training. Same with chief privacy officers. Education is crucial. Letting people know not only what they have to keep secret, but why. Giving them a sense so they can make some judgment calls. They understand the stakes and then how to properly use the tools, especially the attorneys and their support staff who are dealing routinely with more confidential information, company confidence, and their own obligations than anybody else. If you have an opportunity to set up your systems, Pick those that work better within legal requirements. That's what Legal Tech New York was all about the other day. ABA has a tech show, Law Technology News. There are resources. It's why only lawyers remain using WordPerfect. I'm not recommending that, mind you, but lawyers are the only ones left. But billing systems, document storage systems, document tracking systems, email choices, portable devices, Choose ones that work within our unique obligations. And as we've learned, we are now, it is not only just a good idea to keep up with the legal trade and the ethics opinions, but the American Bar Association, the New York State Bar Association, other relevant influential organizations are telling us that we have to keep up with the technology that we are using even if we can't build it or, config or configure it, at least to understand it well enough to see where the problems might lie and to seek more expert help, the same way we do with forensics and e-discovery. We know what the issues are. We know where to find the right people to help us. But unless we know what the issues are, just as we heard earlier from Sophia, with her clients, we don't know what questions to ask. And speaking of, I'm happy to take any. Uh, I'm not going to force them on you. I want to once again uh, thank all of you for attending. Thank Barbara Hakimi, our coordinator of, CS, uh, of, of CLE, excuse me. Dean Peter Sinisi, who has made this whole IT thing happen. 
Um, our dean, Patricia Salkin, our new dean here at the Law Center, who is very supportive and actively monitoring, but I think she's in Texas this week speaking at a conference. If you haven't met Patty, uh, make every opportunity to do so. We're really happy to have her. Um, and so on behalf, I, of course, I want to thank our speakers who are still here, um, as well as those that, that have not been able to stay. Uh, so on behalf of the Turo Law Center Institute for Business Law and Technology, thank you very much for attending. Have a good day.